Kawatsi Haupa. It's so incredible to be with you all today. As we get started, I'd like to welcome Brian Melendez, our Paiute and Western Shoshone relative from Nevada. He is a co-founder and chair for the Nevada Statewide Native American Caucus and a founding member of the Nevada Native Vote Project and Native Voters of Nevada. He will start our time together with a prayer and a blessing. Welcome, Brian. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank our grandfather, grandmother, creator, makers of all things for another beautiful day of life. We ask our ancestors and the ones that are always with us to watch over us and help us and guide us in this way. Bless us, everybody. Bless everybody from wherever you are, from wherever you're viewing. And let the people that are here through this whole Native Power Building Summit, let them all get a blessing. Let the people get a blessing. Let our lands get a blessing. And we ask as we have the strength and we move forward that we come together in a, in a unified voice, in a unified way to do the best that we can during this election season. That as crisis and things of calamity come towards the forefront, that our minds and our hearts and our spirits be strong and brave. And that we, that we go through this time to see the opportunities that are in front of us and to not always loom in the, in the, in the negative thoughts and the hard thoughts, but to see the prosperity and the abundance that is always around us as, as indigenous people in our ways in this land are beautiful and that we are beautiful and that our families are beautiful. We ask for nothing but prayers and, and magnificent things for our women and our aunties and our grandmas and our daughters. We ask that they be strong always and that they always be protected and that the voices that they need to have and the positions that they need to have and the ways in which they need to walk for themselves be honored and cared for and respected always. And that's what we ask for. We ask that the people that are coming, the young people that are coming, the young people that are here, that they will be strong and they will be courageous and that the new movements that are developed from the times that we've had to the times that we're in will shape the way in which we move forward. And we pray that all of our generations can help them and help us. And we pray that then during this time in this election that we can come together, that our people will register and that our people will vote, that our people will take that time that our people will see all of the opportunities, our people will see and understand why it's important for us to, to use our energy and our time this way. That's what we pray for. And in this moment and in this time, we ask that the spirits and our ancestors do as they have always done. Watch over us and help us and guide us and teach us many things. We ask our grandfathers, grandmothers, creators, makers of all things to let the people that need to find us, find us. And let the people that never need to find us, never let them find us. We ask the holy ones, the holy people from the stars, from the sun and the moon, from the land, from deep within the waters. We ask our ancestors to bring for, bring for us lots of dreams, especially, especially in this time of hibernation. Bring us lots of dreams. Bring us lots of dreams and allow the people to discern those dreams for themselves to understand that the mission that our people are on, that we need a great healing, that we need a great healing for our minds and our hearts and our bodies, and that we are worthy of such a great healing. And we also ask that our people can deliver those beautiful messages and our people can deliver those beautiful things back to the land again. And I know we have that in us. And I know we are that. And so I ask all of the all of the spirits that are with all of us, our ancestors that are always with us, to look over us and help us and teach us how to be the way that we need to be every day. And so I'm, I'm so grateful to be here with all of you. And I pray that all of you will get a really beautiful blessing today. And the things that you're gonna hear and the things that you're gonna learn and the things that you will see let them be a part of your let them be a part of your story 
let them be a part of your, your knowledge and your experience in your life so you can go out and make this world a better place, a sustainable place, a kind place, and a caring place for all future generations. Thank all of you for your time and consideration and always much love and respect to our ancestors and, and the creator. So thank each and every one of you for your time and consideration today and have a beautiful day and enjoy yourself. Aho, pijasu pichu na mano to'o. No kena no pijasu pichu. All my relations. Oh, I have Brian. In this political moment today, we really needed that today. Thank you. My name is Anathea Chino. I am from Acoma Pueblo. I am a co-founder and the executive director of Advanced Native Political Leadership. We are a national organization aimed at creating a political home for Native people. We launched in 2016 to understand and address the challenges and barriers that prevent our full and deserving participation in the political process. We are focused on creating national political engagement strategy with culturally relevant training programs and recruitment pathways for new leaders to run for office. Understandably, we have so much distrust in a system that was not designed for us to participate. In this election, we have far too much at stake to opt out or dismiss the current political system. We cannot and will not stand by while decisions are being made about us without us. We have to engage in this political process at every level. We have to run for office. We have to work on campaigns. We have to push for change every single day. It is our time to lead. Advanced Native Political Leadership aims to ensure that we are written into the future and not erased in the present. We honor our indigenous values and ancestors, and we are deeply committed to ensuring our communities are equipped with the tools, resources, and knowledge to demonstrate our inherent commitment to each other, our earth, and future generations. Going forward, Advance will provide a political home for Native people, and we will increase the number of Native people elected into elected office. We are worthy of being seen as leaders for all districts and states on and off tribal lands, and we are committed to examining all the ways we can reimagine solidarity while meeting the needs of our communities. Among a phenomenal lineup of brilliant political minds, artists, and strategists, we are joined today by our co-founding team, including Peggy Flanagan, Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota, and the first Native person elected to statewide office. Kevin Killer, former state senator from South Dakota. Christy Castro, one of the most amazing facilitators and strategic consultants I know. And our two newest staff members, Prairie Rose Seminole, our project manager and MC for part one of our afternoon, and Pam Bradshaw, our director of operations and um, special initiatives. We hope you leave our summit today with a solid commitment to centering voting as a cultural value in your lives and more urgently in the coming days leading up to the election on Tuesday, November 3rd. You'll hear from leaders across the country who have been fighting for all of us. The urgency around our work at Advance cannot be stressed enough, and we know we cannot do this work alone. Thank you for joining us, and it's an honor to kick off the 2020 Native Power Building Summit. Now it is my privilege to introduce my sister and co-founding colleague, Peggy Flanagan, the Lieutenant Governor of the beautiful state of Minnesota. Minnesota is showing us how challenging culture shifts can be. We hold Minnesota in our hearts and minds as we think about the dangers of fully addressing racism and demanding that our needs be met. Peggy's leadership is evidence of progress and hope. It is an honor to be in this movement and world with you, Peggy. Or art, that we all have a role to ensure that our people are not erased and that we can show up and fully live as who we are as indigenous people. And as Anathea said, the decisions are not made about us without us. And to be very candid, that can be a challenge. Uh, I uh, am the Lieutenant Governor of a state uh, that was founded, as all of us are, uh, in states that were founded on stolen land and uh, that was created uh, through uh, the undervalued labor of black and brown people in, in the state. And so as I walk into the Capitol every day, uh, I often think about um, how I am working within a system that was not created by us or for us, 
but in many instances was created to eliminate us. And despite everything, we are still here. Um, I recently, I lost my father at the beginning uh, of, of 2020. And um, my dad, Marvin Moneypenny, uh, was a fighter and an organizer and wanted to burn the system down. And he said to me, he said, my girl, I want to burn down the system and you want to work on it from the inside out. We need both. And so that is the spirit in which I am sort of operating in 2020 and the spirit in which I hope you enter into our time together uh, today as we talk about building power and that we need all of us to use our gifts and to be in role to ensure that we have what we need. As Anathea mentioned, we here in Minnesota are on the front lines of um, just so much uh, division and heartache. Certainly as we've watched the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately impact communities of color and native communities, but also as we have seen the murder uh, in front of our very eyes of, of George Floyd and the unrest and trauma and re-traumatization of our communities uh, since that, that very moment. Um, and we are, we are working and trying to work across lines of difference uh, to ensure uh, that we are, are accomplishing everything that, that we need to accomplish um, while we are, are fighting um, uh, folks who, uh, who frankly um, are adding to, adding to that division. So there are certainly people in this moment who would wish that we would sit it out, that we would um, just give in to the trauma and the fear and uh, to be quiet. Uh, but that is certainly not where we're at. When we look at all of the issues that impact us and affect us as indigenous people, uh, the lack of representation in our educational system being reflected in our educators and our curriculum um, and what that means for generations uh, down the line. Um, when we see our healthcare system uh, that has failed our people repeatedly uh, and when we see uh, environmental injustice that is done to our people and not with our people um and consultation uh then you know these are all of the things that are at stake in this moment i can tell you that um you know every day i am aware of what decision lies in front of us and in front of our communities in 55 days and that this truly is the most important election of our time as we look to local, state, federal elections and who we elect as president. And I know as we have seen in the past that Indian country can absolutely make the difference in ensuring that we are electing people who share our values, who respect treaty rights and tribal sovereignty and who know that we have a robust urban native community that makes part of, um, makes, tells a full story of, of Indian country. And so, uh, you know, I know that uh, in 2018, when Governor Walls and I were elected as we ran as a, a ticket and an, as a team, on election night, um, as the results were coming in, Indian country turned up and turned out. And as we looked at the electoral map, we could almost see the very outlines of reservations and native communities in our state. And that is because um, our, our folks were engaged and motivated and we've been able to work in partnership with tribal governments and leaders across the state to continue to move things forward. We need to remember that election day is one step. It is one step, um, but ensuring that elected leaders are held accountable and govern with us uh, is, is the step after that and that we have more people from our communities who are running and serving in offices and are at the table. And I look forward to sharing a little bit more about that with all of you uh, a little later on. But this is our moment and our time for folks to say 2020 is the year when Indian country showed up and threw down 
and uh, where folks know that they have to come to our communities, hear us and see us, value us, and earn our votes. So Chi Miigwech for, for giving of your time and attention to this very important gathering today. And I'll hand it over to my sister, Prairie Rose. Miigwech. Way to go, Shted. Peggy Flanagan, thank you so much. Nawaj, Adunath Daga, and everybody. My name is Prairie Rose Seminole, I'm a Rikra in Northern Cheyenne. I'm calling in from Western North Dakota, the homelands of the Rikra Nation. I am the program manager for Advanced Native Political Leadership. And I'm excited to welcome you all today as the MC for the first part of our gathering. Summits like this are an opportunity to deepen our collective consciousness for how we can build Native power through a social justice lens. Hearing from the panels today, I hope you walk away energized with a deepened understanding in our shared political education, and I hope you've made some valuable connections. Before we hear from our incredible lineup of panelists and throughout the day, we'll be hearing from some of our favorite traditional and contemporary artists. Our first performer we want to welcome is Artson. Widaba Nije Kodiwe Artson Nabez Darumara Raramuri. Hello, my name is Artson or Nabez. I'm Tarumara Raramuri from Chihuahua, Mexico. And I feel very blessed and honored to be here today for the Native Power Building Summit. It's really nice to see so many Native leaders come together to bring awareness to political leadership. So thank you for having me. Hello, everybody. This is Chrissy Castro. I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation, as well as a co-founder of Advanced Native Political Leadership. And I am so happy to be with you today. We wish we were in person. Um, we know that that will happen soon and we'll, we'll, we'll rejoice and, and have a lot of joy in our gathering. Um, but we're so happy that we've gotten such a really uh, positive response of so many people joining this conversation. So over 500 people have registered for this webinar. Um, we are not going uh, Facebook Live or anything like that today, but um, rather we are going to share um, parts of this conversation throughout the day um, with um, you know, the rest of our community um, after this. So just wanted to say a note about that. Um, wanting to also introduce our first panel. Uh, the first panel that we'll be um, hosting is called Defining This Power Building Season, and we will be joined by um, Nick Tilson, President and CEO of Indian Collective, um, Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota Peggy Flanagan, and Crystal Echohawk, Founder and CEO of Illuminative. And so thank you all. This idea of this panel really came from the idea that we know that this political moment, uh, this is not really a moment, um, that this is a movement and that we're part of a movement that's, you know, uh, longer than seven generations before and back, but it's a continuous movement. And so really just wanting to see like, what is this election 
season mean? Um, so that's the focus of the panel. But even I want to take a step before that, because as you know, I'm not sure how other people feel in their communities, but even the conversation about the word power itself, um, I think is something that we need to talk about, right? So for having a power building summit and all of our conversations are, are centering around power, um, how, are, how are the different ways that we actually understand what power is? Um, and so I wanted to invite um, Nick Tilson to really talk about that as a starting point for our conversation. So Nick, um, from your vantage point, you know, what is power and how is that part of Indian Collective's theory of change and how is that part of the work that you're currently engaged in? Good morning, everybody. Good to my Lakota language. Um, Power, it's an interesting thing. In most of our languages, we won't find the actual literal translation power, right? Um, but if you look at, uh, if you look at the way in which we acknowledge creator, you know, uh, Lakota, we say and every one of our languages, we will find a way to address um, the mysteries that happen in environment. And I always like to bring that up too, because we tend to like sometimes not connect our you know, uh, our indigenous spiritual roots to the power, uh, to, 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 to the words power. Um, but when I think of power in, in the modern sense, I think of our language, I think of our culture, I think of the spirit of our ancestors. I, I, I think about us being authentically who we are without having to, uh, well, without having to edit for anybody in political power and institutional power. When I think about power, I think about um, that movements are not made up of organizations. Movements are made up of people. Organizations are tools. P people power um, uh, is made up of individuals. The government is a tool to, to make that happen. And so when I think of the power, I think of spiritual power, cultural power, the power of communities and people. And I think that when we tap into our power as indigenous people, we have the ability to radically tear down these systems and build new ones. I think of power as not being complacent to um, a white supremacist structure, but radically reimagining that structure, tearing it down and building it up at the same time. And so that's why here at the Indian Collective, so much of our work is about defend, develop, and decolonize in the cross intersection of defend, develop, and colonize and building the collective power of our communities and our people in that way. And so, um, you know, that when I think of power, those are the things that I think, I, I think of multi-pronged strategies, I think of political strategies, spiritual strategies, cultural strategies. And I think about us radically, authentically being who we are, because that's what, our, what we have to offer to the world. And that's something that is radically needed in these absolutely crazy times that we're in. Beautiful, Nick. And um, I just want to say that um, it really brought tears to my eyes when um, I saw the action that you all took as Indian Collective um, defending the Black Hills. And um, just wanted to ask, like, you know, what is the what was that trajectory of this not being a moment? Because you told me a beautiful story about how you're continuing the legacy of your own uh, relatives and your community's fight in defense of the Black Hills. So. Maybe you want to just say a word about that before we queue up the video that we want to share. It's just a reminder that whether they be the political struggles that we're in today, um, the struggles for our land, that we stand on the shoulders of the ancestors who came before us. We stand, and I don't just mean the ancestors from hundreds of years ago, I mean our parents' generation, the close ancestors. And to recognize that the power of us acknowledging the sacrifices that were made before us to, that allows us to build the collective power that we're trying to build today and that, that they forwarded courage into us and spirit and fight into us. And so, um, you know, I would say that, that that's, that's, that's power too, right? That's absolute, absolute power. And I think that um, as we think about the struggles that we're doing today, um, you know, we're so focused on like, let's focus on doing something new, something radical, something edgy, something, um, something, you know, radically imagining the future. Uh, while we do that, it's so powerful to also lean and stand and remember um, the, the foundation that was built before us and to think about the sacrifices that were made to build that foundation. And, and so that's what, you know, so much of the struggle for the Black Hills is one of the longest legal struggles for land in the history of the United States. And people sacrificed their lives and their freedoms for that struggle. 
and uh, we are continuing on that struggle as we as we lead towards victory and getting that land back and shifting the power structures that affect indigenous people today. Thank you so much, Nick. I just wanted to say a word about this video as well and the importance of solidarity with all peoples. Um, and so the video that we're about to share was actually previewed um, during the Black National Convention through the Movement for Black Lives. And I think it was a beautiful showing of solidarity between Black and Indigenous peoples. Um, so we're going to go ahead and cue that video now um, and then we'll, we'll come right back. Who's We will walk upon Trump tomorrow. We'll say enough. We'll take back this stolen land, one rock at a time. If it started with Mount Rushmore, and it's not going to end. It will never end as long as we have breath in our lungs, as long as we have blood in our bodies. We will keep marching. We will keep shouting. We will keep protesting. No. Protecting. Because this is our land, and we're going to take it back, and there's no and systematic racism. We've seen what happened to our black brothers and sisters. We know that the movement for Black Lives and, and for Black Lives Matter stands with us as Indigenous people as we collectively fight for our liberation, for the collective movement for our people. And our, and our goal is not just to resist. Our goal is to radically, radically transform this country so that it works for everybody. This is sacred land. This is Lakota land. This is my land. I can stand right here. The aggression today was come out from you guys. Because we want our land back. We ain't going nowhere. This is our land. It's been our land for thousands of years. To the Benny and Tommy Sheriff's Department, to the Highway Patrol, this is a warning to each and every one of you. You are unlawfully on our land without the consent of our tribal leaders in violation of our treaties. We have an opportunity now that we're giving you to stand down and vacate our land. Whose land? Our land! Whose land? Our land! This is the land of the Osheki Shakoi. And we're prepared to stand our ground. Today has been a proud day to be Lakota. Today has been a proud day to be indigenous. We shut down Mount Rushmore for three hours. And we did it in a good way. We felt that power from our ancestors. So we'll feel a tonka, a chichi apalo to each and every one of you. For our people, for our black hills. Right through here, sir. For the Osheti Shakui. That was powerful. Um, I just still get moved to tears. So thank you so much for um, for everything that you do, Nick, um, all, you and your team, everything that you do. And i um, so inspired by the initiative that you all have launched. And we're going to hear from Crystal Tubles, which is, I think, the director of the Land Back campaign. I may have that wrong. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, and I wanted to also um, just link that into the importance of building power, um, you know, how that land back movement, all the different facets of power that you talked about, um, that that really feels like it's the, our connection to land and to water is a, a core spiritual uh, place of power, right? Um, and so we're very much um, connected and moved in that way. So, um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear from Crystal more about, about your work there. But also wanted to invite Peggy into the conversation um, and Lieutenant Governor. Uh, we had a conversation about, about this moment and about the importance of having political representation. And as we know, you um, are the highest uh, elected Native official that's ever been elected to state office. And just would 
really love to hear from your vantage point, what difference does it make to have um, a Native person in elected office? And, you know, how does that connect to, to building this, um, this kind of um, restoration, right, of, of our traditional values, of our Indigenous values, um, and, and making uh, right again um, what we know has gone so wrong after contact and colonization. So I wonder if we can bring you um, into the conversation. Thank you for the question and thank you for this panel. Um, I think as you know, you, you look at um, uh, Nick and uh, just his spirit and contributions and um, the embodiment of, of power, frankly, um, and, you know, to hear from Crystal on just the identities and how are we showing up as ourselves and telling our own story is so important. And to then also talk about politically uh, what, um, what it means to have representation, uh, I think is, is just really important. Um, and, you know, I think the, the word power in general, as we talked about, can make some people feel uncomfortable. Um, uh, we have seen it used in really, uh, really bad ways uh, against our own folks. Um, and we need it. And we need it in order to ensure um, that our people uh, have, have what they need. And so um, I'm in a kind of an interesting space. And I say interesting in the most Minnesota way possible, um, you know, uh, in that uh, Every day, uh, as I mentioned before, I walk into a building and I take two deep breaths. One breath is a breath of protection um, and one breath is just the breath of responsibility of this moment. And what it means to have right outside my office, there is a, a large statue of Newt Nelson, who was the author of the Nelson Act, uh, which uh, ordered the removal of all Native people uh, to what is now the, the White Earth Reservation. He was not successful, but we still have a statue to him right outside my office. And so I'm always aware of working within a system that wasn't created by us or for us. And full disclosure, as the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Minnesota, um, the job description is pretty short. <laughs> it's like, be ready. And that's about it. And then I oversee the capital architectural uh, area and planning board um, and uh, local capital security as well. Um, but, you know, I can't take a vote on things. I can't sign bills into law, but have still figured out how to make sure that we have a voice at the table. And in some of those ways, it was making sure that in partnership with our Native Women's Caucus in uh, the House uh, that of representatives and uh, some, some powerful leaders in the Minnesota Senate that we passed the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's uh, Task Force uh, into law and um, will continue to invest in ensuring that our Native women and girls and Two-Spirit community members are are seen and heard and valued and protected. Uh, we also were able to pass Executive Order 1924 that the governor signed into law that calls for consultation uh, between every state agency um, and each tribe in Minnesota. A tribal liaison is uh, assigned in each state agency as well. And we have regular meetings um, and conversations with our tribal leaders and have a tribal state relations office that has now been created. And had we not been able to build those relationships on the front end, frankly, um, our COVID-19 response would have been very different. So we've been able to partner, have daily calls with our tribal leaders um, and regular calls with our urban Indian leaders as we've responded to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So that is powerful of having representation um, to ensure that uh, we are not um, seen as an afterthought, but that we are at the table from the very beginning as we are determining which way to, uh, to move forward when it comes to policy or budgets. Um, and what can be most powerful out of that is that you don't need an Anishinaabe Kwe to be the Lieutenant Governor. Um, but that we're building that infrastructure and making sure that that's in place. So long after we have the like fifth, sixth, and seventh 
uh, native uh, people in the, the governor and lieutenant governor's office. So that's just how we do things. Um, and that I think is, is ultimately the goal that we're putting things in place that last long after uh, we're gone and changing the way that state government uh, interacts and partners uh, with tribes across uh, the state and the, our just beautiful, robust urban Indian community that we have here in, in the Twin Cities. Thank you, Peggy. And I know in preparation for the panel, we were also talking about how, I think if anything, the last administration, what it taught us is that we thought we won and we could just go ahead and rest. <laughs> And it's like, oh yeah, you know, this is not about a hierarchical kind of solution. It's not that we just have to put somebody in a you know high position of power and just, you know, but it re it requires people power and organizing. Can you just um, maybe say a few words about that as well? Sure. So, yeah, I don't know about you, but um, I think about the president every single day. I didn't used to do that, right? Um, during the, the previous administration, I was like, we're cool. Um, and you know, there certainly were more things that we wanted and, and things that we needed to push, but it wasn't sort of consuming, um, consuming me and consuming others um, all day, every day when we were thinking about what is the next bad thing that's going to come that we're gonna have to push and fight against. So um, we have certainly, um, uh, taken a great big step backwards since the previous administration. And the opportunity for us to vote is right in front of us. And we have to make sure that we are voting early. We are making sure that our votes are counted. Um, and then the real work starts after we elect leaders, right? And they are inaugurated to make sure that we're not just saying like, cool, we'll see you in two years or four years. But that our expectation is to continue to see these folks before, during, and after the election so that the solutions that are being moved forward um, to frankly not get back to normal because normal was not working for our people, but to get back to better, that we are at the table and that we are being consulted and that our solutions from our own communities are then incorporated into the policy proposals and budgets and investments that are made moving forward um, and that frankly, all we, uh, that we can just have the expectation that we have uh, an administration that does truly acknowledge that treaties are the supreme law of the land and that that is where we start. We start with a government to government relationship. We start with knowing that we have a unique political identity and that that is the foundation on which we build everything else. So we can't rest. We got to keep pushing and keep moving and ensure that folks see us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I want to bring a Crystal Echohawk into this conversation. And Crystal, I'm such a fan of your work. Um, thank you so much for everything that you do for Indian Country. Uh, it seems like every other week you're popping off with a new initiative or some big new campaign, which is so beautiful to see. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, your research, the recent survey that you um, uh, have um, been collecting information for and, and any kind of initial sneak peek uh, preview to what that's telling us about Indian country. Well, thank you so much, Chrissy and everyone for having me today. And it's so good to see Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and Nick too, um, and just to like see the sheer numbers of people on this this convening today. It's, it's really exciting for such an important topic. And so, I mean, I think I wanna take one quick step back before I talk about the Indigenous Futures Survey to just really how, as we talk about building power, you know, we've really over the last four years been looking at how we use data, right? Data as a way of how we build power, right? And as we look at data and as we look at research, you know, back in 2016, we launched the uh, Reclaiming Native Truth Project, of which Nick was one of our advisory um, council members for that. But it was really about a power analysis and really understanding what are the dominant narratives, what are the dominant perceptions in this country that are not only wielded by all kinds of Americans, but by powerful institutions that have a lot of power over our lives as Native peoples, whether it's the courts, it's Congress, it's looking at media in all kinds of ways. And through that power analysis, right, through research, we were really able to kind of 
better uh, like understand one of our greatest threats is our invisibility, right? With almost nearly 80% of Americans knowing little to nothing about us and a significant part of us, that percentage, not even thinking that we still exist anymore, right? And really understanding that and understanding that the fraction, these slivers of representation in TV and media and our political representation, how much that affected us and how much that erasure of native peoples really served in the minds of the American public to really dehumanize us and how that feeds things like decisions made in quirks and, and, and looking at the bias that it that really exists that's created by things like racist sports mascots and really um, toxic stereotypes and false narratives in this country like we all receive free government benefits and how that really shapes the American public's perceptions and people's in, uh, perceptions and power about us and how that's really been used to harm us as Native peoples. And so really with that research, we were able to empower ourselves with a power analysis of understanding how, how important it is for us to disrupt and interrupt that invisibility and the kind of dominant narratives that exist in this country that are really about that we don't exist anymore, that we sort of faded to black about 1890. And that's literally what 90% of the schools in this country conditioned generation after generation to think that we no longer exist and that the majority of students grow up in this country never understanding that there is a government to government relationship. They don't understand treaty rights. They don't understand who we are as native peoples today. We are seen as something as a past and a caricature. And so we spent the first part of that research really understanding the importance of narratives because it shapes the way that people not only think about us, but the kinds of decisions that are made about us and for us. Um, it really illustrated and underscored the importance of representation in all facets, from political office to media and pop culture, in our schools, and in, in every level of society, why it is so important for us to disrupt that invisibility. And so with the second phase of research that we've partnered with the Native Organizers Alliance and the Center for Native American Youth and the, and the University of Michigan, the next phase was really, you know, about how do we go to our own people? Right, the first phase was about mapping what do non-natives think about us, but the second phase of research is going to our own people. And as Nick said, power is about our own people and it's power is about our voices. And what our research showed is that in order to fight that invisibility, in order to change the future for our people, we need to amplify our voices, our stories, our issues, and our power. And so Indigenous Futures went out and we did a nationwide survey. Um, it was of um, more than 6,200 Native peoples from all over the country participated in the survey project. And we really modeled after a project led by the Black Futures Lab called, Lab called the Black Census Project. And we went out and through that survey, we asked people about what's the impact of COVID-19 on your lives and your families? How did it affect your health, your finances, your mental health? We went out and asked people about, are you everything from registered to vote? Um, to, you know, are you, in, are you facing any voting barriers? To what are the issues that are most important to you and your community? Uh, to really understanding how is racism impacting your lives? We're in the moment of systemic, a reckoning with systemic racism. Well, how is that showing up in our lives as Native peoples? Because I've heard throughout the summer as we stand in solidarity with the Movement for Black Lives that that's also, we feel very triggered as Native peoples because we have suffered from systemic racism and from white supremacy. So how is that manifesting in our lives? And so with that survey and with that data, we, we are going to be able to just in a couple of weeks release the results. But we found that more than 50% of our people have, are suffering major economic hardships because of COVID-19. We are seeing that our people do not have adequate access to testing. Right, we're seeing that the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19, we've heard a lot about in the media, but now we're actually able to begin to map some of that, which is so important. Because one of the problems is, is that we're still not captured in data today. And when everyone's reporting on COVID-19, you notice it's typically Black and Latinx, and that is the narrative frame. And we're not giving voice to how that impact is happening to Native people. So this is why we're going out and capturing that data, and not only capturing it, but to amplify that story. Amplify that story in the media. We need to be pressing political candidates about the impact of COVID on our lives and the systemic inequalities that are underlying that. And so that's part of the research. We also found really quickly that some of the most important priorities to our people are first and foremost for our people. We center our people above ourselves. And that was what was really extraordinary to see. And that of the top concerns of Native peoples going into this election and beyond is number one is about mental health across the board. It didn't matter gender, age, geography, where you live in Indian country, you're concerned about mental health and how that's impacting our communities. 
The other top concerns were how we need to care for our elders and protect them how we need to protect our native women and girls and members of our LGBT communities from violence, how we need to build our community infrastructure, improve quality education for our children, and how we need to fight for climate justice and protect our environment. So really understanding what those priorities from our people are, our place, a baseline in which we're, how we think about organizing going forward. How are we going to build power to take care of those things for our people? How are we gonna amplify what our issues and needs are so that candidates are responsive to our power as Native people and that we are an important voice for this election? Thank you so much. And I, um, I really feel like this time of COVID has really, uh, changed, I would say, my thinking and also my, under I think a lot of folks that I organize with our understanding of the importance of narrative change, that it's not just like, I used to think of it kind of like, we'll figure out our organizing strategy and then we'll figure out how to communicate that out. And now I see it as, no, it's not part of the work or as an add-on to the work, it is the work, right? And similar to thinking about political organizing, I think I used to be like, forget the system, never made for us, let's not do that. And then realizing, oh, it's a tactic. It's a way to get us what we need. It's, these are the decision makers that make decisions on behalf of um, our people's lives every day. And so not only do we wanna influence, we wanna be in those positions of power, right? So it's not an either or kind of thing. It's like, we need all the strategies, <laughs> we need all the tools and we need people in every position. Um, so thank you so much uh, for sharing that. I think we wanted to open up our Q and A. Uh, maybe we can take a question or two from the audience. Um, so, you know, how is this sitting with you? Do you have any questions that uh, you would like to ask our panel? So we have a question from Tammy Tiger from Nevada. Um, thank you, sister. I'm happy that you're here. Uh, she asks, uh, can you go into more detail on what land back actually means? Um, when non-natives hear land back, I think they're confused and maybe threatened that they will lose ownership, especially in Oklahoma when the Supreme Court, Supreme Court ruling came down. I can touch on that and also a plug for, a plug for uh, later. There's a whole panel that's going to unpack that more. So I don't want to deter this panel too much, too much from it. But what I would say is this, this is, this is a narrative, right? This is a narrative that is coming from our people on a meta, a meta narrative that has been coming from our communities and our people. Research, I'm sure, would tell us that this narrative, this, this narrative makes people feel threatened. But to us, this narrative is about, it's about unpacking uh, and not just not just getting our physical land back, but tearing down the systems of white supremacy and racial injustice that were created for the stealing of our lands in the first place, and for the structures that are, have been created to perpetuate the stealing of our land, whether it be Bureau of Land Management, um, Bureau of Land Management, National Forest Service, National Park Systems, um, the trust system. There's a lot of systems in place that have been designed um, to to uh, to steal indigenous people's land, and so this this narrative that we're building and movement that we're building is is a is a conversation that actually leans in to a much bigger conversation about reparations, about recons about restructuring the way in which the entire uh, um, system has 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 oppressed indigenous people, um, and so I think that we're making a big effort and a big focus on the on the the return of public lands, so people don't think that we're coming for their houses. Um, right, we're not coming for the houses, trying to burn them out of their houses. Um, but you know, uh, you know, some of us might be some of us might be wagon burners, but we're burning the wagon of white supremacy. We're burning the wagon of institutional racism. And and what we're saying is that is, is we can't just say what we're against. We have to say what we're for. And so by by building a, net, a meta narrative like land back, we're talking about actually the transfer of lands back to indigenous people, public lands back. To indigenous people in, in the process tearing down the systems of white supremacy and injustice that have perpetuated that in our communities. Thank you so much for that. Um, and 
I see that there's a few more questions, especially about the Oklahoma um, win. I just wanted to uh, briefly mention our next panel is going to be about rematriating leadership um, with several elected uh, Native women elected officials. After that, we're going to have a panel um, about celebrating our wins, which will definitely be um, uh, we'll be covering the McDirt decision. Rebecca Nagel is joining us. Uh, we'll have Crystal Tobles from Indian Collective talking about um, their work on land back. So we're going to go deeper into that conversation. And then we're also going to be hearing from Amanda Blackhorse about the movement to end race-based mascots. Um, so all of that is coming up. And um, I wanted to also uh, briefly introduce a tool that we're going to be using. Um, back you know at various points um, in our session just an opportunity for us to hear um, from folks about how you're processing um, reflections that you have any kinds of loving words that you want to share um, really anything on, under the sun and so the way that this works is that you open up a new browser um, could be your cell phone uh, your desktop what have you you go to menti.com and you're going to add in the code Six five nine eight nine four two, and somebody will drop that into the chat as well, and um, we will be able to uh, get a sense. And we'll have an opportunity here to see how uh, how you all are taking in this information, um, what reflections that you have for us. So um, that is going to stay open throughout the duration of our time together, um, and we'll be weaving it in and out. So um, you you can just keep that open and continue to use this channel as a way to share your feedback and reflections with us. And we'll be bringing your thoughts. It's all anonymous, so uh, you can be safe that. Um, you know, we are taking up the themes and um, again, that'll be open our entire time together. So that is definitely an avenue for you to um, share any reflections that you might have. And we just have a few here. It's important to vote. We have more power than they know. Appreciate having this space. Narrative change is so important. Thankful to have this grounding in identity and why this year is so important. So again, I'm gonna stop my share screen, but that's gonna be um, open for the entire summit. And uh, with that, I wish we had more time, but let's just say that this is the start of the conversation. We know that we are gonna go much deeper and we'll be weaving the foundation of everything that folks shared throughout the rest of our day today. So deep appreciations to all of you um, and just love you all so much. And thank you for the work that you do on behalf of our people. That was an incredible panel. Thank you, Nick and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan and Crystal Echohawk and Chrissy for moderating. Our panel absolutely reminds us that in the long term, we must prepare for every scenario, right? The fight will not be over in November and we need to strengthen not only our organizations and Native leaders, but we are the containers for this, this change work, for this electoral work and how important data is. We need those power analysis. Thank you, Crystal. In the long term, we must set the conditions for a strategic years long efforts to secure structural victories that improve our people's conditions, whether it's environmental, economic material, land back, right? Increasingly build that power and lay the foundations for progressive governance and systemic change we are absolutely stronger together mm -hmm. and with this I want to do a quick break with our multi-instrumental artist live the artist greetings my name is Olivia I go by live the artist and thank you so much for having me today shout out advanced native political leadership project for having me on and this song is dedicated to all the fierce women leaders rising up and dismantling patriarchy.
this is Jacqueline Russell. I'm a co-founder of Native Women Lead and uh, president of Good at Navajo. And it is such a wonderful honor to be surrounded um, by so many incredible Indigenous Native leaders. Um, and it is a special honor to be a moderator of this panel, Rematriating Leadership. I am delighted to welcome uh, Ruth Buffalo, who is the first Democratic Native American woman elected to the North Dakota Legislature. Ruth is a citizen of the Mandan Hadassan Ruthra Nation. We also welcome Ponka Wee Victors, who is Tana Otham and Ponka from uh, Oklahoma and is a uh, Kansas State representative. And finally, we um, are delighted to be joined by Trisha Zunker, who has long served her community. Um, she's been twice elected by her people, the Ho-Chunk Nation, to serve as Associate Justice of the Ho-Chunk Supreme Court. So welcome to this incredibly powerful um, panel that my heart is a flutter just um, being able to uh, share space, digital space with all of you, and with all of you um, powerhouse matriarchs. So we are going to talk about one of my favorite topics, um, and that is um, Indigenous women leadership. And so I first want to um, welcome uh, Ponka Wee um, to, uh, take this question and maybe if all of the panelists can turn on their screens, their videos, just so we're all set to go. Wonderful, Pankali, it's wonderful <laughs> to be with you here. And um, it's so excited to learn about your work in preparation for this panel. And um, we hear that there is some incredible matriarch, like, magical storms that are happening in Kansas and you are um, really at the, the heart of cultivating leadership. And so I'm just wondering just what inspired you to uh, join and, and really take the action to step into um, running for office. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here this afternoon with you all. And um, it's one o'clock here in Kansas. And so thank you again for asking me to be a part of this panel. It's an honor to uh, be on this panel with the other uh, Native American women leaders who inspire me. Um, the reason I got involved into politics because I was uh, just growing up, I always questioned different things um, like our, our healthcare uh, system, you know. Um, also, I wrote to our governor in eighth grade because I was scared to go to school. It was during the Columbine shootings. So I always question things like that. And then after college, I did the Native American Congressional Internship in Washington, DC with the Morris K. Udall Foundation. And it opened my eyes because I didn't see none of us at the table when decisions were being made um, about us. And so I questioned that and people said, well, get involved, you know, go home. Um, get to know your local leaders and so I did and I worked on a few campaigns and opportunity presented itself to run for office and I went for it and here I am 10 years later I'm running for my sixth term now and it's hard to believe but during that time I noticed them um, around the table the absence of Native American women and so when I would come to the table the first thing I would see was I'm the only like Native woman here and um, so I had three strikes against me I believe in Kansas I, I was a woman I was a brown woman and I was a Democrat in Kansas so you know I just feel like there should be a more voices at the table when decisions are being made that impact our communities and so that's why I decided to to uh, encourage other Native women to run for office and just last week I defended my dissertation on the rise of Native American women political leaders. And I mean, because when we started out, it was very slim about 10 years ago, and now it's growing so big, and that's awesome. And so I'm so excited about that, and, and I based my research um, off of that. And so, I mean, I would love to share it sometime of, of my findings. So 
anyways, that's my answer to your question. Thank you so much. And we're going to dive into um, just asking you a little bit more about your research. And I want to welcome the other, other panelists first, but um, also just Pankavi, thank you so much. Um, and congratulations on the defense of your dissertation. That is such a huge, just a huge accomplishment. So congrats. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so Trisha, I would like to welcome you um, to join us. And I'll wait for that to get queued up. Wonderful. Welcome, Trisha. <clears throat> Um, Trisha, you have been building up political power throughout your career as an indigenous as an indigenous woman. What has driven you to take this path? And yeah, just and I think what we're, we'll be kind of flowing into is really just there is also this huge current of women also embarking on that same journey. So if you can also just reflect on like what this movement also means to you and being a part of it as well. Yeah, wonderful. Um, first of all, hi, Chwita, hi, P. Hotan Kurashka, Hinakpi, Hingere. It's so great to be here with you all today. Um, my Ho Chunk name is Good Woman. Um, I uh, appreciate the, and I'm honored to be able to share this virtual space with you this afternoon. Um, your question is a great one, and honestly, uh, it, it was never some a goal of mine to pursue uh, elected seats, um, but I felt an obligation and I felt a duty. There was need for, for different things. I serve in a couple of elected capacities right now. Um, I come from very humble beginnings. I am a first generation college graduate, and then I went on to law school, and, um, and then came back to serve my people with that law degree, with that education and experience that I gained. As you mentioned, I am in my second elected term on the Ho-Chunk Supreme Court. Um, I'm also a solo parent, and I returned back to Wisconsin uh, with my young son in tow, and I wasn't home long when it was very clear that a voice was needed to step in. Um, I worked uh, in my local community here in Wausau, Wisconsin on getting Indigenous Peoples Day recognized. First uh, with the city council and then worked on getting a resolution recognized by the county board, um, which passed unanimously. And then I worked on efforts for um, encouraging that recognition at, at, at a state level as well. And it was just a, a void. Um, around that same time, though, I also ran for school board here in my community, uh, Wassa School Board, which is the 13th largest of the 421 public school districts in Wisconsin. And um, again, it was a, a need to step up and step in. There were things that I saw that needed to be addressed. And so I ran very hard and I'm seated an incumbent and a year later, I was school board president. And I'm still the school board president of one of the largest school districts here in Wisconsin. And I brought a different voice that hasn't been there. Um, for instance, Act 31 is a law here in Wisconsin um, that requires teaching on all 11 recognized tribes in Wisconsin twice in the um, elementary years and once in the secondary years. But it's well known that districts just don't meet this requirement. Um, and certainly if they did, we'd have maybe a, a better understanding in communities. You know, we have people that don't understand tribal sovereignty. We have people that don't understand treaty rights and get upset when um, we have tribal members that are, are just exercising their treaty rights. Um, but if these laws were taught appropriate, or if the, the material was taught like it's supposed to be under Act 31, um, there'd be a better understanding. So I became vocal on that. Another thing that I worked very hard on was um, a resolution that I brought to my board to retire Native American mascots, logos, symbols, nicknames, and imagery. Um, and I brought that to my board um, to submit to Wisconsin Association of School Boards, which is a body that uh, lobbies the state legislature. And um, they unanimously supported it. I was the only minority individual on the board at the time, uh, and I, but I was very grateful that, that I had that full support from the board. And then I sought co-sponsorship from districts around the state that would also then submit that resolution to that lobbying body. Um, and during that time, a statewide conversation was renewed here in Wisconsin. And there are 31 public school districts that still retain that offensive practice. And in that conversation, three districts retired. They decided to make that change and said, we are, it's time. The time is now. Let's stop being called 
the Apaches or the Indians. Um, and so three districts did make that change and that's thousands upon thousands of students that will no longer be subjected to interscholastic discrimination. And I share that with you because the reason that happened is because an indigenous woman was sitting in that seat and said, I have an opportunity here that I don't have just showing up and submitting public comment or posting something on social media, but I have a seat at the table, I'm a decision maker and I can push this forward. There's some credibility there. So um, that's why I, I, I believe that I have an obligation and a duty. I'm coming to you from my, um, my Ho-Chunk basket gallery. My direct grandma made Ho-Chunk baskets with her, um, with her siblings and her parents and they sold them on the side of the dirt road to make ends meet. And they went through some serious struggles like all of our relatives did. And I collect these not just because they're beautiful, but because they symbolize to me persistence and resilience. And it isn't for me just two generations later to say, oh, I'm comfortable in my life and I'm not gonna worry about anybody else. I feel an obligation and a duty to step up, go outside my comfort zone and say, the time is now, we need to make change. Um, and, and so that's perhaps a long, long answer to your question, but that's why I'm doing it. it it's, uh, we, need to see, um, we need to see people in all levels of office, representation matters. That's how we further our um, causes, our, our needs uh, will be met better, um, but it, it, it really is just a, a simple thing of I have no choice. This is an obligation and a duty that I believe I must fulfill all the communities that are um, represented here, like in the Zoom call will resonate with that, that feeling of personal responsibility and all of the ways that as indigenous people, we understand that um, call to action. And so thank you for illustrating that. And the baskets that surround you are incredibly beautiful. I've, I've also been in awe of just everyone um, just the way that they're bringing their families and their ancestors to their digital space has been quite grounding as well. And um, I want to right now welcome um, Ruth um, to the conversation. And let me, so Ruth, welcome. It's wonderful to share this space with you. Um, I have a first question for you. Um, you know, what does it mean to be a Native woman leader fighting patriarchy and whiteness and systems of oppression, um, especially in a place that is hostile to, to Native women, um, particularly? Um, it's an honor to be here with you in this virtual space, um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, also want to say thank you to the constituents of the district that I represent in South Fargo, District 27. Um, they elected me to represent them, um, and I am still super honored um, and, and learning, you know, as I embark on this new endeavor of being a state legislator um, here in North Dakota. And so, you know, just to kind of give you a brief snapshot of um, the political landscape, um, there are only two Native Americans serving in our state legislature, um, myself now in the House, and then uh, Senator Richard Marsley is in the Senate. Um, he's a member or a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, um, and he's been there for several years. So he actually helped us, um, he championed some legislation for us in 2017. Um, so we're hoping to really change the political landscape um, by getting more women elected. This year we have three uh, indigenous or three Native American, American Indian women um, running in the state legislature, for the state legislature. Um, uh, a lady here in Fargo, uh, Tracy Wilkie, a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa. She's running for District 16 House. Um, and then also we have two Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation citizens running for District 4, one for House and one for Senate. So it's super exciting. Um, you know, as a, as a whole, we have um, a lot of work to do to get even gender equity in our state legislature. Um, we have about 21.3% of female legislators in our, in our uh, state legislature. So we have about, um, let me pull up the statistics real quick here. There's 30 women right now serving in the state legislature and 111 men 
Um, so there's a there's a lot of disparities there, even with uh, Democratic Nonpartisan League representation. There's 25 of us out of 141 seats too. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do. We're in a trifecta state, which means, you know, the uh, majority party is held by the, the governor and the House and the Senate. Um, so being a new, new legislator, um, understanding the political landscape here in North Dakota, we meet every other year, which is kind of interesting as well. Um, and we meet, for 80 days by law. And so right now we're coming off an off year, um, an interim committee year that they call it. And I sit on the interim judiciary committee. And during last session, I sat on the House Agriculture Committee and the House Judiciary Committee. And as a freshman legislator in the last session, I was um, fortunate enough or you know, very thankful for the people's support um, to carry uh, eight pieces of legislation forward um, and seven of those pieces of legislation passed. Um, and it really wasn't a goal to set out by, you know, trying to break records or anything like that. It was just really answering the call um, and trying to meet the need of our people's requests and demands, um, really in improving the quality of life for, for all people. So it's, it's been an interesting experience. Um, I've really pride myself in bringing as many people with me to the state capitol. Um, as our sister Peggy Flanagan always eloquently states that, you know, widening the doors to the capitol. And I'll always remember that quote that she said, because it's absolutely true. Um, in the North Dakota state capitol, we um, have this process where you let the, the ushers know the beginning of each day if you're going to have visitors um, so they know how many chairs to put by you on the floor and that's also an interesting story to share too about on the floor um, because I would always post on my Facebook page you know um, to people you know you're welcome to come sit on the floor with me the house floor with me and take in a, a house floor session and I would get a lot of messages back and people would say you know, well, what are we protesting? You know, why are we sitting on the floor? <laughs> like, no, you're going to be sitting next to me in a chair, but in the, you know, so it was like um, trying to get everybody used to this new terminology too, like, you know, the, cha the house chambers, the Senate chambers um, is just kind of one facet of, of being in these spaces and bringing everybody with me. Um, and so towards the end of our legislative session, um, the ushers just left a chair behind my desk um, because it was a revolving door of people from all walks of life, all ages, backgrounds, religions, sexual orientation would come and visit me. And so I'm super thankful um, to provide that, that space or that opening for people. Um, and so other story I want to share quickly too is that, you know, I mentioned there's three of us women, three Native women running uh, for state legislative seat in this election cycle. Um, I, as a Hidatsa woman, you know, we, as many of the other, all other tribal nations, we're very prayerful people. And so in our customs, being from matriarchal, matrilineal people, um, from the beginning, from day one, when I got sworn into office, um, I sat during prayer. Um, and so I continued to do that throughout the entire legislative session. Uh, and in our customs, women sit and the men stand. Um, and it's not to diminish us or say that women are weak. It's actually quite the opposite. Um, and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but so it's, um, something that we we do if you go to any meeting or community gathering back home on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation you'll find that the women are sitting and the men are standing um, and so I, I love that you know about our people in that the women are life givers um, and the men are protectors and so um, I did that the whole legislative session and at one point in time you know being the newbie and getting um, some interesting uh, attacks. Um, I remember probably like two minutes prior to the house floor session starting, I texted one of my sisters and I, you know, I said, should I just stand? You know, there's, there's already this, this coming at me. There's all these other things. And she said, no, there's more of us coming. 
you sit, you know, continue to do what we've always done because there's more of us coming. And I truly believe that, you know, there are more of us coming and it's, it's, you know, such a powerful thing to see Congresswoman Deb Holland, Congresswoman Deb, um, Sharice Davids, you know, Paulette Jordan, Peggy Flanagan, you know, really blazing a trail for the rest of us to follow. And, you know, Prairie Rose ran for office here in Fargo, Lillian Jones, you know, so really, really, I'm really thankful for those that have, you know, charted this path for us. And so um, it shows that it's possible, especially Representative Ponkawi Victors. I was, um, I had asked her back in 2014 if she had any opportunities for people to, to volunteer. And so um, I was her legislative intern back in the day. And so that really opened my eyes to see firsthand, you know, a young native woman, she's younger than me, and she's still one of my mentors, um, to see her really holding her ground and really um, being a force in, in the state legislature. And so um, I will just end with that and just say Madzigidads and thank you for allowing me to share this space with you and to share some tiny stories with you. Yeah, Ruth, those are just beautiful stories. My, I teared up um, at just the power of your sister supporting you around continuing and maintaining that practice, knowing that more Indigenous women will follow in your, your footsteps and all of you who are panelists um, today. It's incredible. And just the way that that message echoes um, from Congress, Congresswoman Helen to just across the board, the way that all the work and the, the pavement that you are um, and trails that you're making are really, really meaningful um, for those who will come next. I want to um, welcome uh, Tana Sanchez, who is um, also um, waiting out a windstorm. So in case I want to just share that in case we lose connection to Tana, um, welcome. And um, the question that I um, would love for you to answer is just how is it, how do you experience the intersectionality of being a Native woman leader in your role as an Oregon state elected official? Well, thank you, thank you. And thank you everyone who's spoken before. I caught most of it, but as, as was mentioned, uh, we're, we're finishing up a wonderful windstorm here and uh, I lost you for a little bit there. But, um, so I'm the state representative for House District 43 here in Northeast Portland. And I'm only the second Native person who's ever served in the Oregon legislature and just person, not even woman. And the first one was a woman, Jackie Taylor, who was citizen Potawatomi. And that says a lot about, unfortunately, about the state of Oregon. But, you know, I grew up here in this, in this city and, and in this state and recognized the, the really deep embedded racism and oppression here and recognized that, you know, a lot of our people didn't feel like they could step up and do anything and really Kind of what happened for me is that I've been a I've been a leader in terms of doing um, you know social work. I'm a social worker by trade, and pushing from the other side of, of the legislature, sitting in front of the uh, the committees and, and the panels and stuff, and saying this is what we need, this is what needs to happen, this is what needs to shift over and over again. And basically, then what happened is the then senator you know was going to retire. The representative in this seat jumped for that seat immediately and the seat was open and I literally got text messages saying, hey, you should run for this. And my response to those text messages was, wah, ha, 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 ha. You know, like I thought, that's crazy. That's a great, why would I do that? But then they responded and said, we don't have any representation. Nobody's speaking for us. And, you know, thinking about that and remembering like what that was always like to be that person standing in front and trying to get our word across, which I did, you know, many times. And, you know, we were able to shift some things here and there, but knowing that that was a constant message that we all felt here is that we weren't able to move things the way we needed to. I said, okay, well, let's do this, you know, and, and you know, I had, I'm the kind of person once I commit to something, it's like, oh my God, okay, here we go. <laughs> and, and we had to do it. And it was amazing to watch the groundswell of support from not just the urban community, but the tribal communities throughout the state of Oregon to push for me to actually get that office because somebody stepped up and did that, you know, made that effort. And we've since had a couple of other Native women um, run for office, one who didn't get it, one who's running now, actually, Karina Miller is running for a Senate seat. And, you know, that's what I had always hoped for, was to push forward and, you know, ask other women to step up and do this work, because we as women, 
you know, we're the powerful pushers in, you know, in the social work area and in feeding our people and, and making sure that kids get education and that, you know, Head Start happens or all of those different things. That's the leadership we do all the time, right? You know, most, most of our native programs in urban areas are run by women and the majority of the people who are working there are women. And for us to then take that next step or that other step maybe to a, to a different place and, and say, we need to be the ones pushing the, the real agenda. And, you know, yeah, this isn't of our making, this, this model of, of, of change and shift, but it seems to be the way we're going to have to push it. And so we have to meld those two. And, you know, myself, as, a, as I said, as a social worker, I manage programs in domestic violence and foster care and aging and disability and veteran services and early childhood programs. Like, that's my real life job that pays the bills. I bring all of that to the Oregon State Legislature with the full knowledge of what the, what the laws that we create do to the people on the ground. And that just makes sense. It makes sense that we've experienced these things and that this is the way we need to shift and change all of those things. So that intersectionality is really real on a daily basis. It, it, it makes me the be a better legislator, I think, to be able to go literally into my office right now during COVID-19 and make sure that the elders are getting food delivered to them every, you know, twice a week so that, you know, so that we can make sure our elders are going to survive through all of this and they don't have to go anywhere. Making sure that, you know, we're doing as much early childhood training that we can vi via video, right? And then I could get to report that to the state legislature and say, hey, this is happening well, this isn't happening well. What are we doing about, you know, food resources for communities of color? You know, all of those things are so amazingly interconnected. And I just think it's one of the most important things that we can do as Native people is continue to bring that voice forward of what, what it's really like for our own communities and not just our communities, but every community. You know, as a state legislator, we're making those decisions on a larger level, but really what have our, what have our communities dealt with and what do we need to do differently now? Thank you, Tana. And thank you all so much for just your ways that you um, are showing up for all of our communities and our nations um, in your leadership roles. Um, this panel can be an all day panel and conversation um, and just appreciate you all so much. We have to make room for all the other amazing conversations. So I just want to say again, Abba to each and every one of you. You're truly um, just sharing so much light in the world. I'm so appreciative uh, for you all. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kevin Shirley. My name is Ty Lodgepool. Uh, we're Indigenous Enterprise. We're currently coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm from the Navajo Nation. And, uh, I'm also from the Navajo Nation, from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. It's important to celebrate our wins at this time, and we want to be able to share a little bit of light and positivity with our dancing at this moment. So we hope you guys enjoy it. We also want to uh, give a reminder that all Native people and communities are rising. We also want to give a shout out to those people for working hard throughout these times. so much. We are, hope you enjoyed the dancing and remember it's always built native power in our communities. We also want to tell you guys continue to be safe and uh, have a good rest of the year 2020. Have a good rest of the conference. I have the great pleasure and honor of introducing our next panelist celebrations of our wins. 
We have today Rebecca Nagel, which is an activist and writer and a champion in Native Women Against Violence. We have Re Crystal Tubles, a director of Land Back cha uh, Campaign at Indian Collective, as well as another champion of environmental rights. Then we have Amanda Blackhorse, social worker and activist, as well as really championing the, the you know, Redskins movement and taking, you know, we're not our mascots. So we're gonna start this conversation with Rebecca. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna give you the first question to start us off in this great panel. So what is the significance of the McGurk decision and what role did tribal and native political pow power play in, the, in this decision? Yeah, so the central question of the Supreme Court decision that came out this past July was does Muscogee Creek Nation still have a reservation? And so Oklahoma argued that, um, you know, despite the fact that Congress never passed a law or signed a treaty that got rid of the reservation, that um, basically because it hadn't been recognized in such a long time, right, which we always hear about our treaty rights, um, that the Supreme Court shouldn't recognize it. And fortunately for Muscogee Creek Nation, and I think in a victory for all of Indian country, the Supreme Court rejected that logic very soundly and said you know what like our rules say that congress must disestablish a reservation in writing it doesn't matter whether or not the local state government acknowledges that reservation and congress never did that so muskogee creek nation's reservation was recognized here on the ground in oklahoma there are a series of other court cases um, that are determining the reservation status and boundaries of four other tribes so it's looking like it'll impact uh, my tribe cherokee nation Chickasaw Nation, Choctaw Nation, and Seminole Nation. And I think what was really telling about this victory, um, I think for all of Indian country, is that it wasn't that um, the Supreme Court changed the law or Gorsuch, um, he didn't write anything new. It's not like he had to overturn some other Supreme Court case. What he said is that it just, you know, treaty rights are the same as any other area of the law, and we are going to follow follow the law. And we've already seen it applied um, in a case coming out of Wisconsin. So I hope that it's strong precedent that will help other tribes um, defend their land rights. Um, because so often what happens when we have those rights and we have those rights in writing, when we get to the courts, it doesn't matter. Um, and so hopefully this decision um, can sort of help tribes hold that line. Um, such a a great work and I know everyone was excited um, to see what the future would hold for that. Thank you so much for your great work. So we'll move on to Crystal. Uh, you've launched a new hashtag land back initiative at Indian Collective. What is the role of the land in building political power? Um, everyone. My name is Crystal Tubles. I'm Oglala Lakota, Northern Cheyenne. As mentioned, I'm the director of the Land Back Campaign. Uh, first, I want to just want to say like we we did not actually launch the hashtag Land Back. Um, that's something that has been around. We're we're really acknowledging that Land Back as a movement has existed for a long time. Um, it's also you know we're we're really just stepping into a long legacy of of this work that has been getting done over generations and generations. Uh, many people have sacrificed their freedoms, their time, their energy their livelihoods, uh, you know, in our ancestors, their lives, right, for us to be connected back to our land. But what we are doing at Indian Collective uh, through the Indian, um, through the Land Back campaign is really creating a mechanism to basically connect, coordinate, amplify and resource this movement and so that is kind of our focus and our role and so we really want to make sure that we're you know we're stepping into this long legacy of work but we're really trying to provide the resources and the the narrative and all of that and and we also look at this campaign as as more than a campaign right so we're looking at it as really a political and organizing and a narrative framework from which we work from right and and as we're talking about power that is you know those are like the foundations from which we are building this power to support this movement of land back in in native nations indigenous peoples reconnecting and reclaiming stewardship of their lands i also want to point out you know just with the the black hills is our cornerstone um, it, it, it's the cornerstone from which we are building our foundation for this campaign to push forward this movement. And, you know, I was one of 20 folks arrested on July 3rd at the Mount Rushmore action. And, and what we experienced on that day 
was very spiritual. Everything was very spiritually aligned and, and placed. And there was a path set forward in front of us that was very clearly connected and related to the larger um, uprisings and momentum that our, our black relatives had created when they started to um, tear down colonial statues in, in these statues that represented white supremacy. And so we took it to back to our sacred lands in the Black Hills to Mount Rushmore, the ultimate shrine of, of white supremacy, right? And so that is that was a very, um, you know, strategic choice, but also a very spiritually aligned choice. And, and as we're talking about power, I think it's important to name that like that spiritual alignment that we had is one of our strongest foundations from which we move as indigenous peoples. Um, so when we're talking about power, I think that uh, spirituality is oftentimes left out of the conversation, even though as native peoples, as indigenous peoples, you know, we, we feel it and that's how we move, right? And, and that's how we live our lives. But I think that we need to start naming that and we need to start saying those things. So in addition to like political organizing and narrative frameworks, we also have a very clear spiritual framework um, that we're moving from. And that is what we are, are moving with this, the land back campaign that we have through Indian Collective. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of where we're at with the land back movement. There, there's, you know, a few more points there, but that's basically a general overview from our, you know, where we're moving from with Indian Collective. Ensure that we aren't becoming part of the political machinery that is rooted in capitalism and extracted worldviews. You know, collective um, land back movement is an existing movement that has worked for the size contact in its campaign organizing framework, as well as weaving into the current ups um, uprisings. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like I said, just referencing back to our frameworks that we're operating from, you know, we, we have the political organizing and narrative framework, but like I said, this, this is very spiritually aligned and, and very rooted in our spiritual um, framework that we have as well. I also think that the way Indian Collective is functioning as an ecosystem, you know, we, we really look at it as that is really just a toolkit in a toolbox for how we move forward and really get to um, our freedom, our liberation, our sovereignty, right? And so learning how to use these tools um, means that we have to like navigate those things and navigate these systems, right? But I think ultimately at the end of the day, what we are truly working for and what we are truly doing is using this toolbox, using this toolkit that is Indian Collective and really leveraging it as a way and as a mechanism to dismantle white supremacy. You know, the, the um, framework are some of the political analysis and framework that we're operating from with the Land Back campaign is really acknowledging that all of the, the symptoms of oppression that we are experiencing as Native peoples, you know, so I'm referencing like suicide, um, homicide, missing and murdered Indigenous women, um, you know, lack of access to like healthcare and education systems, right? All of those things can be directly rooted back to when we were forcefully removed from our lands. And then every system that has been built on top of those lands since then that continue to systemically or systematically oppress us can be traced back to that, right? And built on top of those, those stolen lands. And so our analysis is basically saying that to dismantle and truly create change and to truly get to our liberation and our sovereignty, embodied sovereignty in, in peace, um, that we have to actually go back to the roots, which for us is we are saying that is land back. And so that is how we've been navigating that and not getting wrapped up in all of, um, you know, capitalism and all, like perpetuating those systems, right? Uh, so that's kind of where we're, we're moving from. Thank you for sharing. And then now we'll go to Amanda. Um, so your question is, what kind of power do you attribute to the long fought victory over race-based mascots and spe specifically the Washington team? What does this teach us about the power that we want to cultivate as native people? Yes. Um, so I think we all know that um, the reason why the Washington team really made the move that we had been urging them to do for many, many years is because of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I think that is a, a time in, in our history history now where we realize where the society has realized um racism and what racism is and 
and is actively moving um, to make changes um, in society. So I think, I, I don't think that it would have happened so swiftly, um, as swiftly um, as it did because of the BLM movement. But Native people have been fighting against racist mascots for, for many years. And, you know, I don't want people to feel discouraged and say, well, you know, um, you know, we, we, we've tried this for, for many years and, you know, nothing happened. But what I can say is that I think what we did throughout those years was really open people's eyes to who actually Native people are, real Native people, not fictitious characters, not mascots, you know, not the Hollywood Indian, but who actual Native people are. Um, and then, you know, pointing out what those stereotypes are, how people see us, the lens that this country and this world sees us upon. And so I think that, um, you know, we've, we've, we've done many different things throughout the years. You know, we've protested. We've, um, I was a part of a lawsuit that was started by Suzanne Harjo 25 years ago. Um, you know, Native people have, have always urged the Washington team to make that change. And, and also other teams as well, other um, professional sports and elementary education. Um, high schools to make changes in colleges. And so that's our power as Native people is that, you know, we, um, we can stand up for ourselves and we can stand up against, you know, multi-billion dollar um, industries and franchises and let them know that, you know, we're not your mascot. We're not someone that you can just um, play with. Our image is not for sale and that, you know, we will do whatever we need to do. We will stand up against these giants and, you know, use our, our resilience as Native people, you know, and really push forward because, you know, there's a lot of things that happen throughout the years where they try to silence us. They try to bury us. They try to, you know, come after us and make fun of us and, and threaten us but we prevailed you know we we kept going you know and i think that the the more that they came at us the stronger we became as native people um and so we just we have to continue no matter what um and we we have we built that voice and that um momentum throughout the years as native people and um and this is that was the result you know um it, it is a victory for sure but we also have have other fights still you know there's still the kansas city team you know there's still um i have my little baby here um there's still the kansas city team there's still the chicago blackhawks there's still the cleveland indians many other schools throughout the nation who um have native mas mascots and nicknames we still need to address those as Native people. So, and I, I, I feel a tremendous sense of power now, especially with the win of the Washington team, you know, under us. I feel like, um, you know, we, we can do it. It's, it's totally possible. You no, know, I'm from Kansas and we are trying with the Kansas City team too. And it's just extremely frustrating when still high schools here in the Kansas City area, carry us as their mascot. Um, thank you for the great work that you do. Um, so we have one more question for all our panelists to wrap it up. Um, you know, there is so much we can get down on for good reason, but there were a few weeks that where we kept winning on all fronts. How did that make you feel? And what important, what's important about celebrating our victories? Let's start off with Rebecca. I mean, I think that that's, um, I think that that was what was so emotional about the Supreme Court decision is that none of us here in Oklahoma were confused about what our treaty rights were. We knew what those treaties said. We knew what the law said, but so often that doesn't matter as indigenous people. And I think, um, yeah, just being here, I mean, you know, because the pandemic, we couldn't get together, but seeing everybody react on Facebook, on Twitter, um, to that decision coming out, 
I think it um, it was really affirming. And I think, you know, we we stand like on the shoulders of so many people who came before us, like Amanda mentioned, like Suzanne Harjo, generations of Native people um, who've really built us up to the moment that we're in now. And I think that we do have these series of, I think, increasing visibility from the mascot issue to Standing Rock to the work that Indian Collective is doing, where, I mean, I remember a few years ago, like when I would talk to people, it was almost like they had no idea about anything, having to do anything with tribes. And so I think that we're finally breaking through that wall of invisibility. Um, and I think that that public education is gonna go a long way. And, and I think that those wins are really, really important. You know, like they fill your cup up. So that way, you know, you have something that can keep you going um, for the next fight. Cause we definitely know that it's also not over. How about you, Crystal? How did these wins make you feel? And you know, what, how, what's important about us celebrating our victories? Yeah, you know, July 3rd happened, uh, you know, with the Mount Rushmore action. And then we, we were coming off of that high and then we got word of the McGirt decision. And then we, the, you know, the following day we got word that, uh, you know, the different rulings in the KXL fight and the Dakota Access Pipeline fight, and then the um, Washington team name. And so it was, we were really riding this high. And what it felt like is that we were in this moment of, um, of, of just like, this catalyzing energy, right? This like spiritual energy that just like sent this like pulse out, this like spiritual pulse out into the universe. And like, I know it sounds really corny, but I truly believe that, right? Like these, all of these things that we've been doing and all of the work and the effort and the sacrifice that, that all the generations before us had been putting in, um, it, they like, they, they came together with all the other movement spaces like Black Lives Matter, movement for Black Lives and the work that they've been doing, our Palestinian relatives, like there's so many things going on right now that I felt like all of it just kind of converged and, and it, it really gave us all the momentum that we needed to push forward. And it's important to recognize that and to acknowledge it and to be proud of those moments, right? And be proud of that. And, and I truly think it also is, a, is an indicator for how united we need to be. You know, like we, we don't win these battles alone. Like, uh, and we most especially do not win, you know, for lack of our languages, like these wars alone, right? So like getting to the, our true, collective liberation like we have to do that together and i think what this moment represented for me and what i felt about it was it was it really reinforced that right we need to bring ourselves together like in these spaces for example in in many other spaces that exist collectively to continue to push forward um continue to bring our our spiritual energies together to bring bring our organizing energies together to bring our our political and our narrative energies together to really push these forward um and that you know for the first time ever you know, it, as an organizer, a longtime organizer, I've I've kind of made amends with the idea that there's a lot of things that I am doing and working towards that like I may not see in my lifetime, right? And and that's the thing. And but with that said, we are in a moment right now of of so much like power that I know that not only is it possible for us to get our lands back, but we will, and we will start with the Black Hills. And, and we see it, you know, we've seen that with the name change when they said that will never happen and it happened. And so we can win these things and we will win these things. And I, I'm really excited for the next steps uh, that, we, that we're gonna see coming out of this moment of time. Statement, thank you for sharing such an inspiration. Um, what about you, Amanda? You know, these wins that we, victories that we have, and you know, what's important about us celebrating them? Yes, I think it's, um, I, I was saying that I wouldn't celebrate the Washington team uh, name change until they actually changed it. Um, but the fact that they retired the R word is something definitely, you know, we should, um, we should definitely celebrate. You know, I'm kind of a cynic when it comes to these sorts of things where I'm like, uh, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. Um, so, but it's, it's incredibly important. And like Crystal was saying, um, you know, watching the wins happen in August 
Um, it was just, you know, back to back. It was really empowering to see. And I almost couldn't believe it. I'm like, is someone playing a joke on us? Or, you know, because, you know, you, you just don't see that very often. So I think it's really important um, that we do take that moment to to look back on this and, um, you know, learn learn from, you know, what we've done and, and you know, do things better next time. Um, and so I also want to just say um, to everyone out there, keep in mind um, on Thursday, there's going to be a group of um, Native people outside the stadium and, and um, on Kansas City, um, their first um, uh, football game of the season. Um, so there will be a group out there protesting. So we continue, you know, no matter what, even though we, we have these wins, we have to con continue to push, um, you know, it, it's, it, it is completely possible. And, and the next step is to get the Kansas City team to change their name. Anyone going to that event? Mask up, bundle up. It got cold here in Kansas real fast. So I want to thank, thank all our panelists um, for joining us today. Rebecca Nagel, Crystal Tubles, Amanda Blackhorse, thank you so much for sharing. And thank you for the great work that you all do. I am truly inspired and so all of us are. And thank you so much. Thank you all to our panelists. So we're about to go into a break right now. It's going to be about 15 minutes. But before I, I just have to share a few words. The summit really is about um, a movement of not only self-determination and leadership and visibility of indigenous people, but it's about recognizing our inherent in ancestral power and actualizing that gift by stepping into our rightful positions of power to help our future generations. Amanda, thank you so much for bringing your child into this space. I, I can't, um, I don't have words to, to discuss the beauty of sharing this space with, with the next generations and the power of that next generation coming into this. So thank you for, for sharing your, your family with us. I wanna encourage everybody to go to menti.com and give us some feedback. Um, also, if you haven't yet already, sign up for the text messages, text Native Vote to 474747. We have an incredible lineup of, of speakers and artists for the part, uh, second part of our, our uh, gathering today. Um, but for now, uh, we're going to go into 50 minutes of a break. We ask that you just stay with us. We've got an incredible DJ coming in to play 30 minutes of, of a set for us all the way from Red Rock, Oklahoma. Um, but for now, stay with us, get a drink, um, drink some water, <laughs> stretch, um, take care of yourself, but, but stay with us. But I want to introduce um, all the way from Red Rock, Oklahoma, DJ Ollie World, and then we'll have a countdown to when we start up our next session. Thanks for staying with us, everybody.
This is the Native Power Building Summit. My name is Edgar Lonaueva, and I will be your MC for the second part of our day together. I am Lumbee from North Carolina originally. I currently live in Brooklyn, New York, and I am on Lenape land. I am an author, an activist, and a philanthropist, founder of the Decolonizing Wealth Project, and an all-around decolonizer. I look forward to being a part of all of these dynamic, dynamic conversations for the rest of the day. We have such an exciting um, afternoon in store for you. So please stay around and stay engaged. Without further ado, I know this is a moment many of us have been waiting for. It's my pleasure to welcome Congresswoman Deb Holland uh, with us today. Congresswoman Deb Holland serves as the U.S. Representative from New Mexico's first congressional district. She is a former leader of the Democratic Party of New Mexico. She and Sharice Davids, who you will hear from later today, are the first two Native women elected to the U.S. Congress. Woo! Deb Holland has been a longtime supporter of this movement and of AMPL. She spoke at our 2018 summit and she really believes in what we are up to here. So thank you so much, Congresswoman Deb Holland, for being here today. We are um, so honored to have you and we welcome you to uh, the platform at this time. Th thank you so much and apologize. You know, sometimes uh, my, my meetings go longer than I expect and um, I am honored to be here with all of you um, this afternoon. Thank you all so much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today at the Native Power Building Summit. I'm honored to be here and a big huge thank you to the Advanced Native Political Leadership for hosting this summit to highlight the critical importance of increasing the Native vote and full participation in the 2020 Census. I'm immensely proud of the work that everyone is doing to highlight the critical nature of getting folks to participate in our democratic process because Indian country is the strongest when we are together. As many of you know, a beloved member of Congress and dear friend of mine recently passed away, uh, the late Congressman John Lewis, God rest his soul, was instrumental in the fighting for voting rights in his community and went as far as Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina to register voters. He is the reason why there are so many black elected officials in the South today. John Lewis believed in equality down to his bones, whether he spent time registering people to vote in the Southern states or was disrupting segregation norms as one of the original freedom riders. He was unwaveringly dedicated to what he believed in. He never gave up the fight for his people regardless of the beatings he received during the sit-ins and the white only establishments and even after his death in the essay he published on the day of his funeral, where he stated, democracy is not a state, it is an act and each generation must do its part to help build what we called the beloved community, a nation and world society at peace with itself, voting and participating in the democratic process are key. He further noted in this essay, the vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed you can lose it. Marginalized communities across this country have had to fight to participate in our democracy. Our beacons of light in our march toward equality have been great leaders like the Honorable John Lewis, Miguel Trujillo, the World War II Marine veteran from the Pueblo of Isleta who cleared the way to the ballot box for Native Americans in New Mexico. So we all had the right to vote for the first time only, and that was 60 years ago. While Miguel Trujillo is lesser known on the national stage than Congressman Lewis, both their legacies of standing up to injustice to secure voting rights for our people is only a part of our generational fight. They have passed us the baton, and we now have an obligation to run our leg of the race. These leaders taught us that voting is not just important, voting is our power, voting is sacred and must be treated accordingly. Our elders entrusted our generation as the keepers of this sacred power, and if we don't protect it, 
then as Representative Lewis stated, it will be taken away. We all know this is a fact since nothing has come easy to indigenous people in a country that attempted to eradicate our people on death marches, massacred our unarmed, abused, or our children in boarding schools and set fire to livestock in ditches while they burned alive. Our right to vote is our power. The path to have our voices heard is to have full participation in the 2020 census. This is even more critical in Indian country because unlike any other group of people, tribal communities have the greatest benefit from federal dollars since we have a trust responsibility with the federal government that was established through our treaties for the loss of lives and lands that our family sacrificed. Historians have stated that the eradication of Indians was the most massive act of genocide in the history of the world where 120 million Native Americans died between 1490 and the 1800s. And we must also never forget that Hitler was inspired by the Indian reservation system in the United States for the Jewish Holocaust and praised America's extermination methods of starvation and uneven combat of the red savages who were tamed by captivity, quote unquote. Considering that our ancestors had to go, what our ancestors had to go through so we could be here today, to not exercise our right to vote or participate in the federal census is a disservice to those we have lost and the family lines who were eradicated during the Indian cleansing or who suffered human rights injustices like the forced sterilization of native women at Indian Health Service facilities up until the 1970s or the smallpox blankets the military passed out to our people. Knowing our story and the development of America, successes for Indian country have not and will not come easy. This is especially true with this horrendous administration that parallels the values of the darker side of our country's history, which tried to eliminate $8 billion in federal CARES Act funding to tribes during the COVID pandemic or has inappropriately named their alleged MMIW work after a military operation and continues to disrespect us at photo ops parading Native women and code talkers in front of an oil painting of Andrew Jackson in the Oval Office. Another president who also saw no place for Indians in America. In a country that can elect a president who glorifies disrespect and anger based off of a platform guided by fear. It should come as no surprise that we're going to have to fight for our voices to be heard and for those who come after us. That's why we must lead by example in the upcoming elections and federal census count to show our youth what their responsibility will be in the future so we can create a legacy for Indian country together. The struggle that we have faced as Native Americans in the United States did not begin with us and it will not end with us. We, like the late Congressman Lewis and Marine veteran Trujillo, are only a chapter of a larger American story. A story that we'll leave behind for our young ones to continue writing so they can pass it down to the next generation to guide them to protect the sacred. As part of our undeniable responsibility to carry this work forward, to exercise our hard-won voting rights and get everyone to fully participate in the census, I would like to leave you with a quote from the beautiful and immensely powerful Muscogee Creek Poet Laureate, the United States Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo, who once said, a story matrix connects all of us. There are rules, processes, and circles of responsibility in this world, and the story begins exactly where it is supposed to begin. We cannot skip any part. I believe that our story matrix is the legacy of indigenous people in this world that our ancestors planted in us long before we were on this earth. It is now our responsibility to build from the strength of the late John Lewis and Miguel Trujillo for our little ones and the ones who have yet to arrive so they can begin again in the peace times and we cannot skip our part. Again, I am so grateful to have this opportunity to connect with all of you and uh, appreciate all the work uh, that you have done and that you will do. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Congresswoman Deb Holland. We are thrilled to have you here today and just appreciate how you fight for our communities every single day. Um, I am inspired to remember that voting is our power and that we must protect it or they will take it. We will not let anyone take our power. We are used to fighting and we will continue to fight and we will do so through the act of voting. Um, thank you so much for these inspiring comments. Uh, we really appreciate you being here with us today and for your support for of this organization. We appreciate you. Next, we're going to uh, transition and welcome back Prairie Rose, um, no stranger to this space, um, who will moderate our next panel, uh, Native Power in Action. Welcome back, Prairie Rose. Hey, thank you, Edgar, and thank you, Representative Holland. So great to be back with you all during the second half. I want to start with, um, you know, introducing this panel. Uh, the Native Power in Action panel came about um, in a very, very short amount of time, and we really wanted to be inclusive of a lot of the different um, organizations and folks that are in play across the political landscape in Indian country. And so we brought together uh, some tribal leaders, um, tribes, uh, nonprofit um, C3 orgs and some political C4 organizations and wanted to ask them how they exercise power to ensure political equity and fair access in the 2020 ballot um, is, is happening. So the panel is focused really on those innovative ways of organizing and mobilizing and making a difference in this year's election turnout. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Curry D. Bird is an advocate and a philanthropist. He's an enrolled member of the Sisseton Wapitan Oyate tribe of South Dakota, my neighbor, woohoo! Um, as well as a descendant of the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina where he resides. He attended the University of uh, North Carolina Pembroke before graduating from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with a BA in political science and he holds a master's from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Curry is the president of Triangle Native American Society, which is a nonprofit urban Indian organization serving the Native American population living in Raleigh, North Carolina. And he is currently serving a four-year term as a member of the Board of Visitors for the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, we also have Vice Chairman Brandon Yellowbird Stevens of the Oneida Nation, where he was elected in 2008, after, uh, where he served as a, as a councilman on the Oneida Business Committee for three consecutive terms, and continuing with his second term as Vice Chairman. Mr. Stevens serves as the President of the National Haskell Board of Regents for Haskell Indian Nations University, the Midwest Delegate for the National Gaming Association Executive Board and is on the Advisory Council of My Brother's Keeper Alliance. Uh, we also have Lori Wiake, uh, who is Dine and Kochiri in Zuni Pueblo. She has worked as a community organizer on land, water, and human rights issues with land-based communities for over 15 years. She's been working to protect the Native American sacred site known as the Petroglyph National Monument since the mid-90s. Lori is a consultant as also as the board on advanced native political leadership so thank you all and uh, finally we've got taylor patterson of the bishop paiute tribe who is the executive director of the native voter alliance in nevada and so we're actually going to start with you taylor and if i can invite you all to put your screens on yay you're all here so beautiful to see your faces um and thank you so much for giving us your time um so Taylor, we're going to start with you and our C4s. Um, your organization, like many Native C4 organizations, is, is new and C4s are growing across the country. But I want to ask you, how has voter engagement impacted your communities to form a C4? And have you needed to adjust your voter engagement um, during the pandemic. Um, thank you so much, Prairie Rose, and thank you to my fellow panelists. It's so exciting to be a part of a panel with all of you. Um, so yeah, I think as we started doing um, this, like you mentioned, this process has been very new and we've definitely had some fabulous organizers here in the state of Nevada that have been plugging along and doing work here and there, but never under an official umbrella of a native C4. And so I think we were coming from this space of, okay, like let's do some civic engagement. 
let's work with this um, Native American um, Democratic Caucus. And we were finding that there was lots of holes and gaps still that were needing to be filled, even having those different spaces and even working with some C3s and other established C4 groups as well. So we really realized that there was a big opportunity for power building in the C4 space because a lot of folks were utilizing native peoples for their own organizations in a very transactional way but not really including us in a meaningful way within that process and i think when i've been interacting with tribal folks and urban and rural spaces there's this hunger and this passion for really getting our folks engaged and getting people in the political process deeply so i think it's been very exciting to start this process this past year and really be engaged with folks and it's been difficult i'll say because we definitely had an idea of coming in of where we were going to be within that 2020 electoral cycle and everything kind of had to be thrown out the window and rethought when covid really hit because as it's been mentioned and as we all know it hits our communities first and predominantly so we wanted to be very cautious of how we worked within these communities both rural and urban so i think it's really been a shift of like okay how do you do voter contact in this digital space and luckily there's been tons of good trainings by tons of different people about how to organize digitally but i think we really are utilizing this year um, text and phone banks just getting back to that good old relational organizing the the uh my friend and mentor judith leblanc was like you got to do just a good old-fashioned phone tree the way we did with aim and i'm like yeah that's really how you do it you just do it a little bit more updated with um, some better technology perhaps than they had during the aim days but uh, <laughs> we're looking at doing lots of phone banking and um, text programming more so than canvassing which i think is smart in a lot of different ways because unless you have people from those communities you don't want to be out there canvassing anyways and kind of infringing on people's sovereignty and tribal lands if you're not from there um, and as far as our digital strategy, I think it's really important to just put yourselves out there in any fashion you can on social media, on any website you can, on platforms like this with our Native folks. I think it's really fabulous and I've learned so much from all of the other people that sit um, in this sort of table and in this space. So it's been challenging, but it's been really good because like I said, people are hungry for this and they're hungry to be talked to. They want people to hear them and they want people to really engage them so it's been very exciting and also very challenging um but thank you no thank you taylor and i yeah i totally agree with you that there absolutely is this hunger for engagement and and for utilizing those those tools that we have so i want to continue with our our c4 orgs and move over to Lori wiaki who's been um i i witnessed her present on um C4 political organizations and PACs just recently and I felt like you you so concisely put like impact of C4s in Indian country in such a, 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 a way that was understandable but I want to talk to you about um, you know why are C4s good for power building I mean that's the, the purpose of our summer is this native power building but with that with that question what are some of the tools that C4s have used to help um, the the you know not just voter engagement but but maybe even helping campaigns without coordinating with with candidates sure so good afternoon everybody and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today um i just wanted to sort of pick up on a strand that was um put out there earlier today about power um you know i we at so i'm the former director of the native american voters alliance here in new, new mexico um, and also a New Mexico Native Vote. We have a new executive director who's fantastic and her name is Atza Chavez and you should get to know her. But um, one of the things that we've done is we have really um, pushed on our communities to try to begin to define and think about power, right? And it's true that the traditional communities, indigenous communities don't have a direct translation for power. Um, you know, in the traditional way, we're taught to think about it in terms of like, you know, get up early, pray, be strong, be respectful, be reverent. And that's what power is to an indigenous person. But in the Western world, of course, it's, it's money, it's, you know, 
speed, all this other kinds of stuff. And so, um, you know, there were times when we'd been admonished, like, don't, don't try to be just like the Western world and think about power only in that way. And we have argued that it's important to understand that because as a people, we have been oppressed, we have been colonized, we have been, you know, forced into a way of life that wasn't the choice of our ancestors, right? And so it becomes important to begin to think about and to define power. And so for us, you know, we really think about it in terms of, um, you know, our power is our people, right? It is knowledge, it's resources, and it's the ability to implement change that will help our culture and our societies thrive, right? And so we really also have looked at def different definitions and the Paul Wellstone definition is really good. You know, he talks about organized people, organized ideas, and organized resources, right? And so we think that's just critically important. And so for us at NAVA, we realize that voting is one tool in the toolbox. It's not the be all end all, but it is a very important tool that we need to recognize. You know, people talked about other strategies, you know, there's community organizing, there's legal, there's narrative shifts, there's all these other strategies that we all need to be connected and working together um, to institute change that helps our, our little ones, helps the generations yet to come to know of the love that we have for them. And so for us, then that means we also decided we had to become engaged in the electoral political arenas as well, right? Because um, to ignore it was to ignore a big part of what was the problem um, impacting our communities. So just to say that, you know, then for us, we recognize the 501c4 organizations as a way to um, build power. And just so folks know, a 501c4 is actually a tax designation. Um, they call it a social welfare organization. And for us, it's a really good way to demand changes because of several things. One is they allow unlimited amount of lobbying. So you can just get in there and do um, lobby for whatever those uh, different platforms are. Um, they allow us to message to our people in a way that we see the issues, right? Um, the 501c4s allow us to connect to uh, political strategies while keeping an eye on our current and our potential elected officials um, to act on our behalf. So just so you know, the, the C4s, they have a primary and a secondary purpose. And the primary purpose is really about the policy agenda. You know, whether that's sacred sites, it's education, it's economic development or vitality for our communities. Um, but the secondary purpose is the one that I think a lot of our folks get really interested and amped up about um, opening or creating a 501c4 because those are the things that allow us to do things like candidate pledges. We can criticize candidates um, right during election time. Um, we can say vote for this person, vote against that person, right? Because they're helpful to an Indian agenda or they're unhelpful, right? They're gonna um, be terrible on our issues. So, so for us, you know, the, I'm rushing this, but, but it's really important to understand that within the 501c4, there's a lot of tools in there that can be utilized. And so the other one that I think has been really helpful for us has been also to be able to run independent expenditure campaigns. And those independent expenditure campaigns allow us to raise or expend as much resources as we need. If we coordinate with a candidate, uh, we are limited by those campaign finance laws. So we can only do like $5,200 worth of um, advocacy. Um, but if we do it independently, I just got two more things. So if we can do it independently, um, it allows us to do an unlimited amount of um, expressly advocating. The other thing I think is just really helpful is that um, by running a 501c4, it allows us to be independent of a Democrat or a GOP or even Green Party label because we're coming in as Native Americans who want the best for Native Americans. Whoever's out there doing whatever their thing is, we are making our own assessment. We are making our own understanding for ourselves and saying this is the policy and we want whoever's gonna play ball to come to, to our arena and we can 
act upon that in a way that is different than other uh, tax designations. Thank you. I thank you, Lori. And I think that's really important for, for folks to know that, um, you know, the, the indigenous population, American Indian, Alaska Native, however, we identify ourselves as federally or state recognized tribes, indigenous people, like we're, we're a vast plethora of like, you know, different on that political spectrum. You know, we don't vote just one way or another. And oftentimes we don't vote unless we're asked to. And so when we come forward, um, to do voter engagement, oftentimes we're making it personal because these are elected positions that affect our lives in a very personal way. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, Taylor, and thank you for um, talking a little bit more about C4s. And I wanna take us um, you know, all the way across the country to North Carolina <laughs> um, uh, you know, to talk about um, you know, the unique political landscape that is Indian country, because we've got a pretty unique district right where you are, um, Curry, with, within North Carolina, where you have a mostly native district. And in 2008 and in 2012, that district voted for Obama. And in 2016, that district voted for Trump. So let me ask you, how has the, the swing potential of this district create unique challenges? And how are the native voter engagement um, efforts ad addressing those challenges from, from a C3 org? Sure. Um... Robinson County is a very unique uh, county itself. It's a uh, majority American Indian population uh, with a large uh, Caucasian and African American population with the Latinx community being uh, much smaller. We're very rural, we're uh, primarily a farming a community. A lot, we used to depend a lot on manufacturing. Um, so when manufacturing left the area and quote, relocated to China or other areas of the, of the world, um, our economy was really devastated uh, in that regard. So in 2016, um, Donald Trump was running and we were less focused on our uh, social welfare types of issues and we were really uh, focused on uh, policies that were uh, associated with our economics. Um, and we're ready for change basically in our community. And so that's why they went from being a reliably democratic community to one that was um, more uh, influenced by religious values and religious views because of uh, religion uh, had taken over a lot of our ways of thinking uh, in, in our community. And so we, we went more for a, a kind of a pro-life agenda uh, and less about um, some other native values that uh, we exist or, or that exist as far as climate change and um, Mother Earth and those types of, of issues. Um, and not that pro-life is a native, uh, native issue itself. I'm mean, valuing uh, the creation of life is certainly a value that's very near and dear to, to native cultures. But uh, in balancing out all native uh, values, um, that one kind of resonated with our community because of that religious aspect of, of things. Um, and, and because we're a swing district, we're, we're very uh, highly populated uh, voting district. Uh, we're actually more democratic in our registration. We've had a number of unaffiliated voters now um, ha in the most recent elections. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, you know, we've recently had uh, uh, Trump visits North Carolina five times. He's coming back tomorrow, I think, to Winston-Salem. Uh, Vice President Pence, as well as Don Jr. had visited Robinson County uh, recently and, and met with some native folks in that area. Again, kind of putting that pressure or that attention on, on their um, uh, agenda, basically, their platform. But I think with, uh, as far as outreach to our community, um, we're just making them aware that um, there are other values to be considered other than pro-life. Um, and so we're, we're trying to balance that with the census and getting people to complete the census and doing outreach there, voter registration, certainly um, not really um, telling people how to vote, but certainly to be registered and make their voices heard and counted uh, because we know that impacts the um, 
not only the representation of, of folks, but uh, certainly the, the, our voice in Congress, uh, as far as having a voice that would be more affiliated with, with our needs and our, our uh, concerns in our, in our county. Um, and so I think with Robinson County and with Lumbee specifically, and even with natives across North Carolina, we have state eight, eight state recognized tribes in North Carolina, the Eastern Band Cherokee are only ones with full federal recognition. Uh, so federal recognition is also an issue for other tribes in North Carolina. And so just being aware of that as a, uh, as a concern and certainly meeting with uh, congressional candidates, senator candidates, uh, presidential candidates um, is, is an issue that comes to the forefront of most of our conversations with, with any candidate that comes uh, to our counties, uh, any of our native communities as far as uh, them being concerned with. And I think in the past where we were kind of that, uh, in the last election, we're kind of a one issue, uh, candidate i think now you know with things have changed and with the pandemic with the change in economics with the change in uh, personalities and how you govern uh, i think there are a lot more of uh, concerns and a lot more interest paid to who that candidate is and what they bring to to the table and i think people are taking uh, being much more engaged and more aware of what's going on and i think we'll will be a more educated voter in the 2020 elections Thank you, Curry. Yeah, I think, you know, working with tribes poses us, poses some unique challenges, but then you, you intersperse the, the layers of, you know, state recognized and federally recognized tribes and then federally recognized tribes working with state recognized tribes and then organizations that maybe work against those interests. So I can see it definitely poses some unique challenges, but what I'm really hopeful about is a lot of our uh, voter engagement um, organizations, whether they're C3s or C4s, um, are, are working together to get out the vote and have an impact on the 2020 election, elections. Um, and speaking of impact, uh, one tribal nation has had their eye on a particular type of seat. And I want to direct this question to Vice Chairman Stevens. Um, uh, Brandon, uh, so across the country, there's about 280 state supreme and appellate court positions on the ballot. And I know that the United Nation has focused a lens on those particular seats. Can you tell us more about uh, the work um, the United Nation is, is doing um, and, and why it matters to Indian country? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the invite. And thank you, uh, everyone on the panel as well. I'm learning a lot. Uh, but why we focus, I mean, we're focusing a lot on, you know, a census, uh, local elections, school board elections, all the way up and down the ballot. But we, uh, as far as state judicial elections, uh, there's an impact because we're in Wisconsin, we're a PL280 state. And so it does have some, a lot of impact on the criminal uh, portion of, of, of how it impacts tribal members and, and tribes. And so what we've done, um, we actively engaged there was three candidates for the state Supreme Court. Um, it was Ed Fallon, Jill Karofsky, and Daniel Kelly. And so what we did, we sent out a survey or a questionnaire to each of the candidates and received two back. Um, we didn't receive one from the incumbent, uh, Daniel Kelly, um, but we asked six questions, um, you know, why, who, what, where, when, but then more importantly, uh, the question about uh, tribal sovereignty and their interaction with tribes. And so when we did, when we asked the question, they responded to two respondents uh, and we posted that to our website. And uh, so we allowed our tribal members to uh, witness and see the, I guess, the understanding of, of tribal government, uh, tribal law, well-established federal law, the recognition of, of sovereignty and jurisdiction that the tribes have. Uh, and that if the candidates didn't have much knowledge of that, that kind of gave us, you know, a good indication of how uh, they would kind of respond to maybe any tribal, uh, uh, you know, tribal interactions as far as you know, what comes in front of them uh, on the docket. So uh, those are one of some of the things that we, we did with our tribal membership as we're doing with everything, as we try and get the information out to the tri uh, tribal members let them read it. But even further than that, you almost need someone to read the information you're sending out to them because you're getting so much information from everywhere. You're getting, you know, campaign ads from the national level, you know, local and everything. And so you need someone to really focus in and say, all right, this is what you need to know now 
as far as these elections coming up and the impact it may have on you and the tribe. Uh, and as someone said before, is you have to you have to make it uh, impactful for the individual that it does affect them on the ground rather than having some upper policy that will never touch them. Yeah, thank you. Like, and, and, and that's another issue too when it comes to being a 280 state. If you can correct me if I'm um, mistaken here, but that, that means that the state has some, the criminal jurisdiction over tribes. Is that what that means? Yes. Yeah, it's a concurrent criminal jurisdiction. And so the tribes can still adjudicate on, on the reservation as well. Uh, but the state does have concurrent jurisdiction to adjudicate any criminal uh, proceedings uh, on the state and local level. Uh, and so it has this very nuances as well as we have our own uh, police force that, that does enforce state and tribal law that are cross deputized between two uh, counties that we reside in, Brown and Outagamie. We have a lot of things that are happening in Wisconsin and we try to make sure that our tribal members understand the impacts of going to the polls every single time. You know, try to make sure it's like whether the grassroots organizer, you know, the water protectors that these state courts, federal courts, when they do happen, that sometimes more likely those cases are going to be seen and heard before those judges. And so the impact of having someone who understands uh, the appointment process and getting people that understand, judges that understand uh, established federal Indian law, and those that understand the, the int intricacies of tribal government and governance, uh, we're more likely to get good outcomes out of the as a result. And so just really tailoring it to each individual audience so they say, yep, I need to vote now whether or not, you know, I believe in the federal system or not because it will have an impact on my ideals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, people don't realize that our trust relationship is with the federal government and they make decisions on our behalf without us at that table all the time. I mean, if we're going to be working to break down systems of, of white supremacy and, um, you know, those systems that were not created for us, you know, by us, we all need to get involved. And so we'll, I know we'll be talking about more about that with our, our later, later panels as well. Um, we're getting really close to our time. So I really um, appreciate all of you being with us today. And I have one final question, you know, Native Power in Action. Uh, you're all in the field at some level, engaging voters and your tribal community members in, in, some, in some way. So what are, what are we paying attention to next? Or what do we need to be better paying attention to, um, you know, in, in your eyes moving forward? Brandon, if you want to start. Uh, I guess in Wisconsin, what we're, we're really attacking is the districts that, that uh, are highly dense, densely populated by tribal members. And so uh, from, from our numbers, approximately 45% of our Wisconsin Indian population reside in metropolitan areas. And so there's a density within those districts that how do we get them to the polls? How do we make them accessible? How do we give the information out that if they did, in Wisconsin, they sent all the uh, absentee ballots out. So if you didn't make the deadline, you could physically walk in and hand it into where. And we have to tell them that. So those are the things is just making sure they understand what to do in, in certain situations, especially those highly densely populated uh, areas where, where tribal members can uh, make a difference. And I would say uh, our, our, the presidential election in Wisconsin was decided by 27,000 uh, votes. Uh, in Wisconsin in 2016 election, there are up to, that's about 0.7%. There's about 1.7% if you said all uh, Indians in, in including uh, other races, but 1.7 uh, native population in Wisconsin. And so that's enough to sway uh, an election. And so that's why we need to them to understand that they do have an, a direct impact on, the, on a presidential election coming up in 2020. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Curry, do you want to answer that question too? Sure. I think for um, for us, it's it's about completing the census and making sure that our numbers are counted. North Carolina had the largest Indian population east of the Mississippi, and then Lumbee had the ninth largest uh, population of a of a tribe in the country. I, I think for us as a state, we have uh, eight 
recognized tribes in North Carolina. And I think just promoting unity among ourselves, maybe we can't vote as a block to change a, one election like the Lumbee can in our, our district with the Congress, but we can uh, promote our, our issues more as a, a unified or collaborative means to uh, with our General Assembly. Uh, so I think just uh, promoting more unity among ourselves and working in, in collaboration with each other to promote Indian issues, not only for North Carolina, but as, an, as a state nationally. And we did some great work with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline in getting that uh, project uh, ceased and canceled. And I think that was because uh, Indians in North Carolina stood together and, and fought that. Uh, and so I think we could have more impact if we continue to do things like that. Great. Uh, Taylor and Lori, you each have one minute. <laughs> um, I just want to emphasize that um, all these organiz organizations that are getting built are so exciting and important, but it goes so far beyond the election. So we need to really just be setting ourselves up for success and just continuing to support each other and supporting all the causes going on in Indian country. And even though Lori and I both come from the C4 space, it's not just about elections. It's so much beyond that and can really grow and build as time goes on. And I'm very excited for the future and all the organizations involved here today. And I'll say definitely two thumbs up for that statement, but also just that we really need to be working and looking for the coalition of the willing amongst our people. Um, there's a lot of people that don't want to play ball and that's their prerogative. But I do think that there is a definite assault on our democracy um, of this country. And I think that there's an assault on Mother Earth that has been happening a long time, but it's actually, I think if we don't change the political tenor we're in now, it could be a lot worse in within the next three to four years. Um, you know, just looking at what the Trump administration has done to um, roll back, whether that's um, clean water laws, uh, whether that's limiting or shrinking um, sacred site areas, national parks, um, mileage standards. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of things that really do affect our, our holy creation. And for us to recognize that and to be able to engage in the political arena is just critically important for our folks to um, almost like we need to think about how do we mature our movement um, so that we're not so um, uh, self-righteous about our positions, but that we learn to work alongside and compromise. Um, a lot of times you don't win everything you wanted, and I think our forefathers know that, and so we have to begin to work in that spirit. So we got to be humble. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> humble up, humble up, right? No, and I just, I, I, once again, you know, thank you to our panelists. Um, we, we specifically went out and, and, and asked you know, New Mexico, Nevada, um, Wisconsin, North Carolina, um, and other states like Montana, South Dakota, and many others, where the native vote, Alaska, um, will make a difference. I mean, you, you are the swing population, and if we turn out to vote, we will call the election. And so it takes all of us, and I just wanted to just emphasize that, that our actions absolutely make a difference. And you've seen it here from nonprofits to C4s to tribal leadership, all of these layers, even us at the community level, just getting out and working towards, um, you know, not just turnout, but uh, impact because it is personal to us. We can get out and make a difference. We are much stronger together. Um, I want to thank our panelists. We have to move on in our agenda uh, and I get the honor to introduce our next entertainment um, uh, for our artists and that is going to be Ray Zaragoza. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Hi everyone. I'm Ray Zaragoza and I'm here to sing you a song. This is my song, The It Girl. And I also wanted to remind everyone to vote. Voting really, really makes a huge difference and every single vote counts. So please join me. Let's get out the vote this fall. And so uh, this is my song, Be It Girl. It's a song I wrote about really being proud of my brown skin because growing up, I was very insecure about it and really understanding that beauty comes in so many different uh, skin tones, shapes, forms, and that we all 
are it, no matter who we are. So this is the it girl. Thank you. I could tell I was living in a world that wasn't made for brown skinned girls. Just you wait, it'll be a turn. on the magazine Paint me like a debutante your prom queen Pretty little it girl Yeah, that's me Do you ever feel like everywhere you go You're just an act in the sideshow Just a friend A second thought Time you give them everything you got I could be the it girl, can't you see? I could be the face on the magazine Paint me like a debutante, your prom queen Pretty little it girl, yeah, that's me Thanks so much, everyone. I'm Ray Saragosa. I hope you get out and vote this fall so we can build Native power. All right, that was amazing. Ah, oh, Ray, that was so good. You are the it girl. Um, thank you for blessing us with that song. You know, it is a good day to be indigenous. My heart is just overflowing with um, the talent, the wisdom, the fire, and the fight that we have in our community uh, to make change. So uh, thank you so much for that. So next, I'm really excited to introduce Nikki Petrie, who is the Executive Director at the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute. This is our final panel of the day. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, young people about the critical role that they play in building political power. So uh, thank you so much, Nikki, for being here today. We look forward to hearing from you and uh, the youth activists. Ah, yes, ah, his is Chins My Indian name is Hoile, which means meadow lark. My English name is Nikki Petrie. I am Coeur d'Alene, Kalispell, Nisqually, Yakima, Squaxin Island, and joining you today from the land of the Tulalip, Coast Salish, and Snohomish territories. I'm the executive director at the Center for Native American Youth. At the center, we are committed to building political power with Native American youth. We know that our young people are fierce, and when they have the tools and resources to lead, they can truly create transformational power. CNAY has invested just under $200,000 directly into the hands of Native American youth from urban, rural, village, and reservation spaces from throughout the country in community action and power building initiatives. Whether it's through translating the census into Yupik so elders in the village can understand and complete their forms, to creating murals with the purpose of promoting discussion on building political power, to hosting social distance powwows for civic engagement, or mobilizing peers for phone banking for an entire community, 
we are seeing youth-led initiatives truly move the, move the needle. I'm honored to be joined by some inspirational leaders, Cordelia Fallsdown, Sam Schimmel, Anthony Tamez, and Cheyenne Phoenix. Cheyenne is from the Diné and Northern Paiute Nations. She is an indigenous grassroots organizer who was born and raised and currently works in the occupied territory of the Tongva and Tatavian people. She works for the California Native Vote Project. Anthony is a Black and Native organizer from the city of Chicago, who currently serves as the Youth Advisory Board Vice Chair at the Center for Native American Youth. Cordelia Fallsdown is a member of the Crow Tribe of Montana and United Kituwa Band. She is a graduate student in Native American Studies and focuses on tribal governance and policy. Cordelia has done work to encourage her peers in college to participate in civic engagement work. She sits on the Generation Indigenous Democracy is Indigenous Youth Council. Sam Schimmel is Siberian Yupik Eskimo and Kanatsi Indian. He is an avid subsistence hunter and fisherman. He serves on the Center for Native American Youth's Youth Advisory Board and attends Stanford University. Sam has combined his passion of community organizing and food subsistence to raise awareness and build power through census and get out the vote efforts. I'm going to ask our youth questions and we will have opportunity at the end for question and answer for the audience. Wonderful. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My first question is for Cordelia and any of the youth on this panel, please feel free to add and build on anything um, that she says. So Cordelia, can you share with us what you're currently doing or what you plan to do to build power for Native American youth in this election cycle? So I am building Native youth power in this election cycle by encouraging my family, friends, and communities to participate in civic engagement. Um, currently, I'm in the process of encouraging Native student organizations at the University of Oklahoma to participate in civic engagement through their own platforms. So these organizations range from um, multicultural Greek life, STEM, student associations, who are all interested in joining these efforts. So I'm really excited to see what they come up with and what they plan to, what they plan to do. Uh, I also have planned, or I also receive feedback from 2018 elections. Um, voting process for my peers and other students. And um, I'm us utilizing that feedback to kind of um, have a plan of action on what we can do with these upcoming elections. So um, in the past, I um, did transportation for students um, to get to the polls and voting booths, as well as explaining how to register um, and the process of voting, because for a lot of my peers, it was their first time voting as well. So I plan to do that um, this fall. Um, currently, I am in the last stretch for increasing census response rates for my communities um, and networks online and back home. So just reminding everybody to fill out the census if you haven't, it's due by September 30th. And, you know, as a youth organizer, I know that it is crucial for our people to have representatives from our own communities. So that's overall the goal that I'm striving to um, achieve. Cordelia, can you share a little bit about what your um, census work has done, especially amid COVID-19? You've been truly innovative in your approach, and I think that you just have some amazing success. Yeah, so uh, when I was approached with CNAY to um, have the opportunity to do a census campaign, um, I definitely had the barrier of how I would um, go about it, given, you know, it was right after um, COVID-19, the pandemic, and how we were learning about it, and so I transitioned what I initially wanted to do and um, made it into an online campaign, and so I did platforms that I'm very familiar with, like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and I did online raffles from May till this past August. I did informationals, and I also um, had a video hosted by other youth leaders across Indian country to provide information on what the census is and what it asks. And my last, um, my last project was I did a virtual dance contest that honored my Crow Fair celebration that was supposed to happen this past August. And um, also it was to encourage census participation. So that one was really fun. <laughs> Amazing work. Thank you so much, Cordelia. Um, my next question is for Anthony. 
Um, Anthony, how are you working to bring together community organizing strategies with election work? And um, why is this important? So I think uh, specifically here in the city of Chicago, um, it's, it's very easy to organize in terms of uh, how close everyone is together um, and being able to access public transportation. But, um, you know, fusing the two together, I think they go hand in hand. Um, and uh, you know, it really depending on how you feel, how you view election cycles and how you view community organizing, um, one of the things, you know, that are very similar in both of those is engaging people. Um, and that's something that I do on a regular basis. Uh, and so, you know, casually just slipping in, um, you know, talking about voting, uh, talking about census work, um, a lot of uh, the work that I have done around uh, voting um, or voter engagement um, and around census have uh, has been in partnership uh, with my youth council Chi nations, um, as well as uh, the Center for Native American Youth. Um, and so uh, by providing me funds, I'm able to um, provide that to my youth council um, and we're able to kind of expand our reach um, and, and organize our community. Uh, here in the city of Chicago, unlike, um, you know, let's say rural areas or reservations, natives are kind of spread out throughout the city. Uh, so they can't vote in a block. Uh, so we, we can't, um, you know, we have to kind of really organize, uh, you know, across different communities. Um, so it also gives us a chance to build coalitions here in the city of Chicago, uh, you know, with the black community, with the Latinx community, um, you know, with the Pacific Islander or Asian communities. Um, that way, you know, in the future, we, we can vote in a block because um, I think one thing that we realized in community organizing is that when one specific group is fighting for a cause, uh, you know, for example, Black Lives Matter, or when we're talking about Apple, you know, those aren't just uh, specifically Black issues or specifically Native issues. Uh, while those are the two main groups leading those issues, they're issues that affect everybody. You know, once, you know, Black Lives Matter, all lives will matter, right? Once we respect tribal sovereignty and we respect the land, then we're not only going to respect tribal sovereignty and the land in one area, it's going to be across the board. Um, and so realizing uh, that, you know, both have um, an inherent power that goes to it, uh, community organizing, being able to engage uh, with your community and voting, um, realizing the power behind both of those, you know, you're able to empower your community. Um, and, you know, there are some people that, you know, have really good reasons, um, you know, when it comes to, well, I don't vote because of this. And it's, you know, one thing that I've learned is engaging folks uh, like that is to be, be respectful of their reasons because, you know, some people do have actual reasons, um, but it is okay to, um, push people to vote and always offer up your opinions and your suggestions because you can change people's minds. This, you know, this past election, we had two, uh, two native elders that have never voted in their life before. And it, it took some convincing, um, and some constant nagging, but with that, you know, we were able to take them to the polls, um, and get them to vote. And so, so seeing something like that, um, you know, two people who are, you know, have, have been alive way longer than I have and being able to take them to the polls. It's definitely a beautiful thing to see, um, you know, because you're able to sit down with your elders or your grandparents and you're, uh, you know, you're able to go over, you know, the candidates and the referendums on the ballots um, so you can be an informed uh, voter as well. What words of encouragement um, would you give to young people or elders or maybe anybody who is voting for the first time? Um, how do you get them to mobilize and inspire them to actually head to the polls? Yeah, you know, I think we're in a very weird situation in terms of some states are only doing vote by mail. Um, and so I would say now more than ever is a time to be 
like an educated voter. So look into your, you know, local elections and seeing, you know, how how they've set up voting this time around because of COVID-19. Um, you know, some states, uh, unfortunately, have you know, they what happened in Milwaukee this past time, you know, they went from, you know, hundreds of, you know, open polling locations down to, I think it was just five, um, you know, things like that. Uh, while we're in a public health crisis, um, aren't um, just a coincidence. Um, so you know, they it's hard to vote on perfect uh, uh, on purpose, uh, specifically for brown people. Uh, and so you know, just keeping that in mind, knowing that they don't want you to vote, um, is even more of a reason to vote for me because you know I'm I. Uh, want to do something that they don't want me to do because I'm a bit of a troublemaker. Um, so I always want to go against the grain, but, um, you know, look into how you should, how you're voting in your state or in your town or your city uh, or on your res um, and make sure you spread the word because not a lot of people are going to know uh, this time around because we're kind of in uncertain times. Thank you, Anthony. Sam or Cordelia or Cheyenne, if you're able to join, um, do you want to build on any of that? Uh, uh, hello, everyone. This is Sam Schimmel. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, from my homeland. Um, we actually just got back this morning from moose hunting. And so thank you to, uh, to Chrissy for being able to set up uh, to get me that Zoom link. But I think there's something that also really is important that needs to be built on here. And that's that civic engagement isn't done with voting. Uh, I mean, you should vote, you should get out, you need to vote. Um, but once you cast your ballot, it's not over. Um, and even if, let's say you cast your ballot and you don't get your way, uh, it's not over. There's still opportunities to work with those people who may be in power, who you will disagree with at times, to get good things for your state and good things for your communities. Um, I know this is a thing that we struggle with here in Alaska. Um, we have a, um, a very good delegation that kind of balances the needs of state economics with land uh, sovereignty and land issues. Um, we are an oil producer and that does cause uh, damage to our ecosystem, but it's also part of the lifeblood of many of the native communities here. Uh, and so remembering that once this election is over, we still have an obligation to get involved with our policymakers, get involved in our communities, and to make the change that we would like to see, to make the change that will make our communities better. So I think that's just something that should be added. Thank you, Sam. Such powerful words. Cordelia, anything you want to add? Um, basically, just to add to that, um, I completely agree with Sam. You know, civic engagement goes beyond voting. It's meaningful participation and dedication and opportunity to make a difference in the life of our communities, you know, and it could be through environmental efforts, community service, volunteerism, political activism. Overall, it just aims to improve the quality of life for everyone. So as, you know, Native people, our efforts of civic engagement utilize cultural norms to engage others and assert our rightful spaces. Mm, thank you. Um, Sam, so this question is for you. You are doing some amazing work combining culture, food, and politics as you build your po power building initiative. Can you share with us what are you doing and what words of encouragement can you give to other youth as they're kind of seeking for opportunities to mobilize and build power? A little bit of what I'm doing. I think that there's, we're as Native people, and I know as Native Alaskans, uh, there's nothing that brings us together more than food. Um, right now, we were on our way back from subsistence hunting and I didn't have my laptop, so I called up one of my friends here in Anchorage and said, hey, I need to borrow your house. And she said, okay. And I said, I'm bringing food. And she said, oh, it'll be great. And so there's nothing that brings our native communities together more than food, more than kind of our traditional foods, because there's culture that's infused in what we eat. Uh, and so understanding that, I decided to meld that with our civic duty to fill out our census forms. Um, every year, between 17 and $21 billion are given to tribes by the federal government. And that money, a lot of it depends on how many tribal members you have enrolled, what you can request, what your bounds are for what you can get. 
And if our communities do not fill out uh, their census forms, then they are not given the amount of money that they deserve and that they need uh, to be able to adequately serve their members. And so in order to get kind of census awareness up where we come from in Kenai and in Gamble, uh, I decided to take one of our traditional foods, smoked fish, and bring it to our elders and our community members and just hold conversations, do check-ins, uh, and talk about uh, the census. So we'd take, we take, we worked with our, our tribal net site and we got about 200 salmon uh, and we smoked them up and uh, put them into vacuum pack packages and then kind of just went uh, to everybody that we knew and all of our family members and all of our cousins and everybody else and got around 700 people um, together. And we just went socially distanced, of course, and said, hey, you guys want to talk outside? We brought fish. And so you do a, you do a check-in and we heard a lot of stories. Um, we heard a lot of stories about our elders turning away census takers at the door. Uh, they didn't know who they were. They said, I'm here with the government to fill out a thing, learning how many people you have living with you. And a lot of our community members were scared by that. Uh, and there's historical trauma there that kind of tells us why it's a little bit scary if you're a native person and somebody comes to the door and says, I'm with the government, I need to know how many people live in your house. Because sometimes our families will have 12, 13 people living in a two bedroom home. And there's CPS issues and things like that that people are worried about. And so when you go out as a community member and you say, hey, this makes it so that we can get more food for our elder program. This makes it so that our hospital in Kenai can have a new x-ray machine or something like that. Uh, once you make it tangible and you directly relate it to benefiting our tribal community, uh, then our members are more willing to take their census and to fill out that form or to answer that door. And the way to do that was through our traditional foods. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> oh, you'd, you'd also asked about kind of encouragement and how do we kind of continue our work in the face of what's going on right now. And I think one of the important things is to, to not forget what you're working for. You may not be able to have, well, we call it atok, but uh, dances. You may not be able to have traditional dances, or you may not be able to go and kind of have the community in the way that we had before the pandemic. But that community still exists. We still have our aunties and uncles, even if we can't see them, that hold knowledge that nobody else has and that are able to, to, to carry on our culture and to teach us more. And so that's why we need to continue working. We need to make sure that we get the share that we deserve as Native people, that our voices are heard and that we're represented on the state, federal and local level. So I think that's what we need to remember. That's amazing, Sam. Thank you so much. You know, as we're mobilizing young people um, from throughout the country and um, culture is very prominent in um, building power together in community action projects and, you know, whether it's uh, food sustainability and, you know, giving salmon to elders or hosting, a, you know, a social distant powwow like Cordelia did to, you know, to get young people and to get the community together to celebrate culture, but at the same time to talk about politics. The reality is our people have always been politicians. And so learning how to speak a new language and continue to be the politicians that we were meant to be, um, it's just really inspiring, especially to see young people lead in this space. I wanna offer it, um, you know, Cheyenne, hi, it's nice to see you, but offer Anthony, Cordelia, um, Cheyenne, any of you wanna join in and talking about how we're bringing together um, culture to build power. Uh, yeah, it's a Manuhu, everyone. My name is Cheyenne Phoenix, um, and I want to say thank you to everyone at Advanced Political Native Leadership for having me on this panel, um, as well as to the other panelists. It's so great to see everyone. Um, and I just wanted to touch a little bit on like what we're doing at the California Native Vote Project um, and throughout California. So um, this uh, past month, uh, last month, we had hosted an Indigenous Youth Organizing Academy um, virtually for the first time ever. 
Um, so there were about 50 Native youth from throughout California who joined us virtually through Zoom. Um, we talked about uh, building Native power, we talked about civic engagement, we talked about um, historic and current movements, both uh, yeah, from the past all the way up till today, as well as what's going on right now with Black Lives Matter and um, the other you know, movements that are taking place across the country and how important they are for us as indigenous peoples um, to uh, be engaged in, in um, I guess, civically as well as like in the streets and out there voting and out there, you know, encouraging our families to fi uh, fill out the census. Um, the other thing that we're focusing on right now with the California Native Vote Project as well as um, other uh, grassroots, uh, sorry, other nonprofit Native organizations as well as the two land-based tribes here um, in Los Angeles, is known as Tongva Territory, is the Tongva and uh, Tetavium uh, peoples. Um, we are working in coalition um, for a campaign called the Indigenous Education Now campaign. Um, which started last year with um, the focus of uh, uh, Native youth at the center. And um, what we did was we asked our Native youth, um, Indigenous Native youth locally, what they would like to see the community focusing on, as well as the community and inviting them um, to a community forum last year to talk more about this education system and how it's serving and not serving our Native youth here in Los Angeles. Um, and eventually we want to work with other coalitions and bring about these, um, these issues statewide. So um, we're really looking to build a model out of uh, the LA Unified School District and how we're trying to tackle their um, lack of tribal consultation, which is a federal mandate, um, and their lack of program funding for the uh, Indian Education Program Title VII uh, Indian education program that's supposed to offer um, supportive services for um, Indigenous students in LA Unified School District. So um, we are currently in the middle of that campaign um, and the Indigenous Youth Organizing Academy was uh, really great in talking about how we're connecting um, our, our young people building them up their capacity, their tools and the skills that they need to continue as the next generation of leaders. Um, and again, we talked about they could get out the native vote, um, which we'll be talking to them more about soon, as well as the census and um, the different movements that, are be that have been happening across Turtle Island. Powerful, Cheyenne, thank you. Thank you for sharing a bit of your work. Um, what excites me, um, Cheyenne and I were just texting before this panel, I was like, I want to get involved in our, um, our uh, Democracies Indigenous campaign. We are working with folks like um, Anthony, Sam, Cordelia, and soon to be Cheyenne and her peers to get young people to lead in, um, you know, power building. What kind of activities and initiatives would they like to do? And then we put financial resources in their hands to go out and make these visions and ideals a reality. With that, they're learning financial literacy, program and project management, and truly creating change that they want to see. Um, Cheyenne, I'm going to ask you a question, and um, it's it's really for everybody. And so I hope that you know Cordelia, Sam, and Anthony, you all want to chime in on this as well. You all are doing some phenomenal and amazing work. And as it was mentioned earlier in the panel, um, this is going to go beyond November, and it's going to go beyond when the census closes. But as we look into the future, um, we close our eyes and think ahead. Think, you know, January 2021. What excites you the most, um, and what gives you the most hope? And I'll start with Cheyenne. Thank you. Um, let's see. So for me, what excites me the most is. Um, the next generation of leaders, all of us here on this call, um, how we're just continuing to connect, um, even though despite that we're in a pandemic, despite that there are, you know, a lot of cases of COVID and a lot of our relatives and families are hurting right now. Um, 
I, I'm motivated and I'm, uh, I'm encouraged to keep doing this work. And I hope many of us here that, you know, that are still able to and have the um, means and resources to continue um, are encouraged by all the uprisings that are happening across Turtle Island from the Indian Collective taking over um, the streets uh, and uh, demanding land back in their homelands, um, as well as the, the, the uh, mascots <laughs> um, that are being removed and changed right now. Um, um, to Black Lives Matter and to, you know, all the things that have happened historically, I think this is um, a crucial time in our generation for us to continue to build our networks, build our relationships, um, build our capacity in every way that we can, locally, within our tribes, nationally, statewide. Um, and even internationally, if we can, because Zoom is offering us so much, um, or you know, technology is able to offer a lot. So um, because of COVID, um, we we're able to reach more Native youth virtually um, with a with the Vote Project. Um, so I'm just looking forward to what um, what all of all of us as young people have to you know push even further of ourselves um, given that we have all this time to continue building those things connecting and um, just like moving forward and powering through and it's not just about the presidential election it's about the ballot initiatives and what matters to our communities education healthcare, care um, social services and it's about um, you know, making sure that our communities are thriving for the next years to come, till the next presidential election, till the next elections, um, until the next movement that happens and sparks, you know, the, the Columbus statues and all those racist statues are coming down. And, you know, like there's so many other, so much work to do that needs to get done. So I'm really, really looking forward to all of that happening soon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anthony, what excites you about the future and what gives you hope? Yeah, um, I think for me, um, it's being able to uh, build a coalition with, uh, you know, outside of my community um, and just continuing to uh, grow that coalition uh, of, of movements and of people. Um, because you know despite what what happens um this election cycle you know we're always uh going to have to fight like hell and so you know i think that's something that you know every single one of us is ready to do um you know here in the city of chicago just this past friday um you know it it was a it marked the year since we introduced an ordinance uh, to our city council to get rid of Columbus, abolish Columbus Day and turn it into Indigenous Peoples Day. And it took an entire year, you know, for that to be heard um, just at a, at a committee level that wasn't even voted on. It was just a subject matter hearing. Um, and, you know, we had to fight to get that, to get that meeting, but, you know, we didn't have to fight alone because we had, you know, people from a bunch of different organizations um, from in our city uh, you know, we had people from, you know, the Black Youth Project, we had people from Black Lives Matter, um, you know, we had all of these different organizations ready to fight for, you know, one specific cause, um, and that was to abolish Columbus Day, and that's something that we're still trying to do, um, and so, you know, that's something, you know, I'm not, not to minimalize it or, or anything, but, you know, that's something very easy and very small that we can do on a local level. Um, so just imagining and seeing what our groups can do uh, collectively, uh, just on a national level and, and here in the city of Chicago, you know, we're the third largest uh, city in the country. Um, so while we should be, you know, leading by example, uh, a lot of the times we're not um, because, you know, of the people that we elect 
uh, to run our city and our city council. And so um, just seeing the next generation of leaders who are stepping up um, you know, who are on this panel, but also in our home communities, right? We, we all have our, our own different skills. And, um, you know, one thing that, that I'm constantly learning um, and that is always at the forefront of my mind is as a leader, you, you know, your job uh, isn't to be at the forefront of everything or to be heard um, all of the time, but it's, uh, the true quality of a leader is if you're building up those around you. And so, you know, when you have other people around you and their skills are building up and they're, you know, becoming uh, more engaged in a lot of the work that you're doing and that they're doing, um, you are, you know, it, it says a lot to your character and to the way of leadership that you uh, are doing because, um, you know, that's what we need right now. We have uh, in, in my community in particular, and I'm sure that it's, you know, this can be across the board, but we have a, uh, you know, a lot of people in my community were gatekeepers. And so, you know, tear, that's a barrier to a lot of the youth. And so making sure to tear that down and, and recognizing the fact that, you know, it's just something that you know, a lot of people don't do on purpose. It's just a, a trauma that has been passed down to them. And, you know, unfortunately it affects us. Um, and so stopping that, that habit and, and addressing that trauma um, is, is something that I've seen a lot of youth, not only here in, in, in my city, but across the country, um, is we're openly addressing traumas um, you know, because a lot of the time it's a barrier, it's an, it's a barrier that's not talked about. And so, um, you know, I'm excited and hopeful to be addressing that and, um, to see what these coalitions can do as well. Oh, thank you, Anthony. Um, Cordelia and then Sam, what gives you hope and what are you excited about? Uh, what gives me hope for the future is just kind of taking a look. Um, back at this past year and even the year before that, you know, we have um, a lot of change that has happened in Indian, Indian country. You know, we have women, Native women in Congress, something that I never thought I would ever see. Um, we have, you know, mascots, um, mascot names being changed and, you know, just movements and spaces that are just you know, being emphasized by our youth and these Native organizations. And um, it makes me hopeful, you know, we can only move forward from here, like what's next to come. I look forward to you know what um, you know what I can do on my part as well as seeing what my peers you know like um, Anthony Sam and Cheyenne will do in their work you know it's very inspiring to see you know and overall just kind of pushing that mess message of you know we are still here let us tell you about it that you know I've heard that before and it stuck with me um, you know that this you know times are changing and um, our youth um, are mentors are these organizations, you know, they're giving me hope. Um, and I'm just excited for, you know, the next round of youth leaders too. When I was starting up to, you know, do this work and have these efforts, um, I didn't, I kind of was in a spot where I felt, in, you know, inadequate and at times a level of uncertainty. But, you know, from mentors and supporters who encouraged me, telling me I can do this, that created a wave of change in my life. And when I think of, you know, Native um, youth and building power, I think of what Anthony said, you know, empowerment of our peers and encouragement of others around us, you know, that unity will really get us far. So that's what I'm looking forward to in the future. Sam, we got two minutes. Oh, what, uh, what gives you hope? Well, um, I think what gives me hope is watching our community's progress um, through kind of our remote elder programs. We're getting some elders that haven't opened up in the past to open up uh, to teach traditions that were otherwise kind of silent knowledge. And as a community, we're healing uh, and we're moving forward. Right now, our tribe is getting ready to break ground on our first uh, school 
we're getting ready to open up, well, not open up, but start building a K through 12 Kanaitse Indian school um, for our tribal members and for their kids. And this is something that we're seeing all around the country. Native communities are being the ones who tell their own story. We are now in control of how we are seen and how we want to move forward. It's no longer a closed consultation that says, all right, guys, we're just gonna throw this to you. It's, it's, it's a concerted effort to help our communities and to help ourselves. And so that's what I look forward to. Um, but uh, before we sign off, I'd just like to plug um, the Center for Native American Youth's Power Building Initiatives. Um, if you go to their website, you can find them uh, and get in contact with Jennifer Petrie, or sorry, Jennifer Peacock, um, to, uh, to either work on a project that tries to get out the vote or something similar. Um, as well, if there's any youth on this call, I know that we have about 140 people. Um, if you or your parents or anybody else would like to get involved with the 2020 and 2021 Tribal Climate Leadership Summit hosted by at &I, please just go to the at &I website and uh, sign up. So thank you very much. Thank you. A big Leland interest for Us, Sam, Cheyenne, Anthony, Cordelia, and everyone for joining. Like uh, Sam had said, for more information about our um, Democracy's Indigenous campaign, or to learn more about youth-driven power building, you can email cnayinfo at aspeninstitute.org. We look forward to continuing to build power together. Lean Lynch and Jessica Oos, thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki, and thanks to all of the youth organizers, activists, leaders. Um, I'm overflowing here. You guys made me feel everything from Hungary, talking about the moose and the someone was chatting about Alaskan salmon in the chat box, uh, to remembering the healing that we need to do um, because of the trauma that we sometimes hold. And knowing that while we're dismantling white supremacy and, and fighting that fight, we also have to um, you know, heal and decolonize our own thinking and how we're showing up as leaders to make sure that we are creating space for the brilliance of other leaders. So thank you all so much. That was super, super rich. I'm completely inspired. So um, next, our, our final speaker of the day, we are super excited to um, have with us, Congresswoman Sharice Davids. Uh, Congresswoman Davids is a former mixed martial artist. Do not mess with her, okay? Um, and a politician serving as the U.S. Representative from Kansas' third congressional district since 2019. Elected in 2018, Davids became the first Democrat elected to represent a Kansas congressional district in a decade. Davids is the first openly LGBT Native American elected to the U.S. Congress, the first openly gay person elected to the U.S. Congress from Kansas, and one of the first of two Native American women elected to Congress, along with Deb Holland, who we heard from earlier today from New Mexico. So um, we'll hear from Congresswoman Davids now. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Native Power Building Summit for 2020. I'm Representative Sharice Davids. I am a proud member of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin, and I'm proud to be one of the first two Native American women ever elected to Congress, alongside my dear friend, Deb Holland. In 2018, we had a record-breaking number of Native women run for office, and we we're carrying that momentum into 2020. And I couldn't be more excited to see even more Natives running for office this time around. And I'm looking forward to when we have more Native women serving in the House and the Senate with us, because Deb and I might be the first two Native American women to serve in Congress, but we certainly will not be the last. But the only way we make that happen is by coming together and organizing, voting, and getting everyone we know to do the same. This is the most consequential election of our lifetime. We're in the middle of multiple national crises from a pandemic threatening the health and economic security of our families to an important and long overdue conversation about systemic racism and injustice in this country. And we know that this pandemic is disproportionately impacting communities of color and specifically our native communities. Meanwhile, we have a president that's more focused on stopping people from voting than he is stopping the coronavirus pandemic. The stakes could not be higher. 
This election is about taking back our democracy, and we need all hands on deck to win big this November. That absolutely includes building native power, which you are focused on in this summit and I'm so excited about. The native vote has the potential to completely shift this election. We're in some of the most competitive states, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, just to name a few. We absolutely need to make sure we're reaching voters and harnessing that collective native power. And for those of us who are able to, we have to do more than just vote by getting involved. And I know you know that. We need to continue to build grassroots support, do all the organizing and phone banking and text banking and everything we can every single day until November 3rd. I am so glad that you all are in this fight, that I get to be in this fight with you so that we can win big in 2020 and make this place better for future generations. Thank you so much for all the work you do. And thanks for inviting me today. Thank you, Congresswoman Davids. Y'all, this is our time. I believe that we can win. As she said, we have got to, of course, vote, but we've got to organize. We've got to give our money, our time, um, make a commitment to do everything that we can to be engaged in this political process to build Native power this fall. Um, now I am so um, pleased to bring to our stage here the amazing team from Advanced Native Political Leadership. If you guys would join me here, um, we want to see your faces and thank you for all the work and um, hear from you at this at this time. Thank you so much, Edgar. And we're not finished with you because <laughs> we have more in store. I saw that in, on the chat, somebody asked, has Brooke Simpson performed yet? And not yet. So she is our headliner act. So um, we hope that you stay with us for that. Um, we really wanted to open space to just have a little bit of reflection. Um, you know, what has this day meant? Um, what are we taking away from this? And so we invited um, one of our co-founders, Kevin Killer, to just share some of the reflections for the day. Kevin? Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Chrissy. And thank you, Edgar, for uh, all your moderation and everything. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, coming from the space from 2018 to 2020, um, you know, it's always in retail politics and being in the legislature for 10 years and being in off, like politics for about 15 years. Um, it's been interesting to kind of see this transition of where we're at in COVID to you know being able to be out in the community be in space with each other and now we're in the virtual space and and i think you know this has indigenous communities and uh, we're, we're making it work you know and it's not the most ideal thing but it, it is what it is and you know just being able to get together and organize and understand that you know we're all in this together we're all moving in a good direction and you know just listening to all the panelists you know throughout the day as you've seen like a highlight and what you know what i've seen personally is what I really enjoy is actually seeing the role of Native women and, you know, that being lifted up by our amazing co-founders and all this kind of stuff and me actually taking a back seat because, you know, when I first started, I was like the youngest and now I'm 41, you know, and stuff like that. But it's good to see like that representative uh, from Kansas, the youngest ever elected in the history because I, you know, I share that same title in South Dakota. But, you know, just to see what she's going to go through and for her to actually have really good mentors like Representative Victor's in that space, you know, you can't ask for any more than that. And just understanding that, you know, we, you know, the, you know, we are basically all we got, you know, in this call, in this space, and understanding that we are all we have, you know, and so being able to, and that's the biggest thing that I learned from politics is, you know, just being able to work with each other to support one another when we're, when we're there. And, you know, just to, just to keep growing, you know, because I think we're redefining how, being in being what a native person in the space, what it means to be, you know, involved in politics, you know, either at the state level, at the federal level, at the county level, at the local level, at the tribal level, and you kind of seen that all over today. And I think, you know, just hearing from, you know, uh, Vice Chairman Stevens about their amazing work they're doing around judges and being able to, I think there was, a, there was a, somebody in the comments saying they do the same thing in Hawaii and making that connection, you know, and being able to understand that this is who we are as, as communities. And this is why it's important that we keep getting together to share stuff. And, you know, and I, you know, as a co-founder, I know I, I don't want to speak for everyone, but also I know as a team, we're all committed to making sure that this is 
the last thing, and we're going to keep moving forward uh, just in different directions in different ways. And uh, just understanding that that you know we're we're here to support you. That's what, this is what we're here for. Um, as an AMPL, you know, we're here to make sure that you're successful and we don't want to set people up for failure because we've done that enough times and we, you know, we've, we've gone through that a lot in our own, our own political leanings and careers and all that kind of stuff. And we want to make sure that we success, set this next generation up for success or if you're running now, set you up for success. Or if you're interested in working on pan ca uh, campaigns, uh, set you up for success. So with that, you know, I'll just kind of stop there. But I just want to say thank you, everyone, for hanging in there. And uh, I just appreciate you all. You know, thank you to the amazing team, Chrissy and Athea, our amazing producers and all this kind of stuff that helped kind of facilitate things. Facilitate things. And, uh, yeah, so that I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. It's so nice to just stop and reflect. I think we're in a culture that's about go, go, go and do, do, do. So it's just nice to just to hear those reflections of helping us to process, um, you know, what we've been hearing throughout the day. Um, so I think we're gonna move to um, some work to share some of the calls to action that we can think of and that we've, um, that we're working on together. And I think perhaps Anathea will be leading us off. Hi everyone, this has been such an incredible day. Uh, so we do have some calls to action and a part of like what we have been working through in like in many of the ways that we've been hearing our leaders speak to us from a number of different platforms. Congresswoman Holland has recently said, let's make voting sacred. Um, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan has also said, let's make voting intergenerational. And we wouldn't be here and they wouldn't be there in their roles without the community um, coming around them and in so many different ways. Um, we have so much to lose and there's so much at stake. So as as we get ready for the um, upcoming election, we want to ensure that we're making a plan to vote. Um, and so we've added here a, um, a link for voteamerica.com. You can check your voter registration. You can update your voter registration. You can register to vote by mail. You can request your absentee ballot. You can receive reminders. You can find your polling place. So it's a, a tremendous resource for us to be able to have access to all the information that we need. And if you have questions, let us know. Um, so thank you so much. And text Native Vote to 474747. We want to continue building Native power and we want you to stay connected. And third, we heard from many of our speakers today that it's the vote is important, but the vote is a, an accent point on power building strategies that are all year long. And so we really um, invite you all to find a political home that's engaged in movement building and power building as see, and sees the vote as part of that year long strategy, which was really, really rooted in grassroots relationships and uh, grassroots organizing and rooted in our cultural traditions, uh, rooted in the power of our spiritual spirituality. Um, so we we hope that you all will be inspired to really engage um, all year long and not just during the election cycle. Number four, this might be stepping out of your comfort zone, but volunteer. Whether you're going to be a poll worker, whether you're going to volunteer for a candidate or an issue campaign, or the get out the vote efforts in your community or for the, even for the census, get out and get engaged and volunteer. We need all of us to show up in so many layers of this effort, mov mobilization and movement building and organizing to really break down these systems of, of white supremacy and racism and the, the upcoming movement of fascism that we're starting to feel every day. If we're, if we're not creating systems for us, by us, we're, it's not gonna happen. So get out and volunteer. And fifth, to also tack on to what Prairie Rose said about doing something that is uncomfortable, um, also donate um, to the work that we're, um, that we're building to build a national political home for us. Uh, there, the reason that we co-founded Advance together is we were looking at the political landscape and really doing an analysis of what we had out there that was an organization that was fighting for us on a national non-native platform and also in our own community. And we haven't had anything. We've had some fits and starts of some other projects, one of them led by Peggy when she was formerly at Wellstone. 
and also Indians List in the very early days, but we are looking to create a space that is for us, by us, and it takes a ton of resources to be able to do this. And we want to continue to be, be bringing the best resources, the best trainings, the best possible webinars, um, that, because we're deserving of it um, to increase the number of people in elected office. Uh, so please donate to, um, to Advance Native Political Leadership. Cool. And uh, number six, you know, just get your family and friends involved. Um, you know, that, that can be emphasized enough, especially this election, um, you know, at all levels, get them involved in tribal state, you know, redefined what that means. We have one of the most amazing opportunities with this younger generation, as you heard earlier in the panel, that to reframe, refocus, and help them re-engage in a different way of looking at politics as we've seen it in our lifetimes. But, you know, we want to hope for the future and politics and elections are all about the future. So always, you know, making sure that we talk from that perspective and share from that perspective and, you know, be positive from that perspective because politics is draining, but at the same time, when we elect amazing people like Sharice, Deb, um, uh, Peggy, you know, the, the, you know, you can't say enough about them and they're gonna do amazing things and getting young people involved is even better, so. And last but not least, we hope that you stay connected to us and invite others that you think would be benefit from this community to join us. So we're really seeking to build a political home for Native people. Um, and whether you're new to us or whether you've known us for years, we hope that you have felt welcomed. We hope that you're excited and inspired. And we hope that you will continue to connect with us and also to connect us to other people who are doing this important movement work throughout the country. So thank you. Thank you so much. I think we're going to go into our final round of thank yous. So if Anathea and Kevin and Perry Rose want to open up your videos. Yeah, thank you. And then Dex, maybe if you can pull up our um, slides here. Beautiful, thank you. So um, I'll just kick us off and we can go maybe take turns from here. So we first want to just thank all of our panelists, the moderators, the performers, and all of you as guests. Um, this has been such a phenomenal um, gathering. Uh, as was shared, we had our first gathering in 2018. And um, although we were sad that we couldn't be together in person um, and we weren't really sure how this virtual space was going to work, um, I have been moved to tears. I've had chills. Um, and I'm super inspired by every single person who has contributed um, their time and their energy to coming together collectively. So we just want to share a deep thanks of appreciation um, to you for all of that. We can go to the next slide. And at the end. Um, I spent a lot of my time behind the scenes raising money so that we can do um, do the work and so that we can fund very strong programs. So I want to thank all of our funders, some of which I know have been have joined us today, um, and they have been incredibly um, um, willing to believe in this vision that we have, that we have like that we're dreaming up in all of the best ways to give us the most of all of the things that we are deserving of. So like I mentioned with our training programs and with moving everything digital and doing a ton of messaging and figuring out ways to move a lot of our work organizing online um, has been a lot of discovery for everyone um, in this new day and age um, and making sure our communities are staying safe along the way. And so we are deeply grateful for the people that helped to um, make all of this possible. We want to thank our co-founders and our staff. Our co-founders are these phenomenal women I have the privilege to be working with all the time and, and co-vision this dream of who we are uh, to be. And so thank you to Chrissy, Anathea, and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, and Kevin Killer. Um, and you all have seen her amazing, their amazing work, uh, but Pam Bradshaw, uh, the Director of Operations, they have uh, are responsible for all of these incredible graphics, have worked, all of us have worked tirelessly on this summit, and thank you all for, for the participation on this level, it's been incredible, so. Cool, and I guess thank you to the behind the scenes crew, 
and I was kind of behind the scenes a little bit all day, but also working on another thing I'm excited to tell people about, but I'll do it a little bit later. Um, you know, PJ Vargas, Dexter, appreciate all your work. Uh, Rosario, uh, Mr. Diego, sorry. Uh, sorry, Ms. Mr. Baines and Derek, I appreciate you all. And, you know, just thank you for being on standby and being able to answer the call so fast. And thank you for, you know, working with us to produce this beautiful event and just being present and walking us through this. You know, we uh, much, you know, they send you Wopiwa. That, that's thank you in our language, Wopiwa, to all of you for being on staff and, and being there to help support us. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And we're going to move um, back to our MC. Mr. Edgar Villanueva, thank you. All right, you all, we are at the home stretch, but we do not want to close out without taking a moment to celebrate and soak this all in. Um, I'm so honored to uh, welcome my Lumbee sister, recording artist, Brooke Simpson. In 2017, Brooke auditioned for NBC's The Voice, which led her to receiving a four chair turn charting top 10 on the iTunes chart week after week and ultimately being a top three finalist on the show. Her newest release is called So Tired, a mini EP, and Brooke will be making her Broadway debut um, in the Diane Paulus revival of the Tony Award winning musical in 1776. Join me now in welcoming Brooke. Hey, what's up? It's Brooke Simpson. I want to thank Advanced Native Political Leadership so much for having me tonight. I'm so honored to be here virtually. And uh, I know tonight's all about building Native power. So let's do that, honey. How I do that is through songs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sing a couple of original songs for you that I wrote. If you like them, awesome. They're available on all streaming platforms. If you don't, then still stream them. We're building native power. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope you love them. This first one is called The Wrong One. Yeah, yeah. All right now. The first time we met, instantly friends, spent all our time together, both thicker than thieves, such chemistry.
Hey guys, so for my last song, I'm actually going to be singing uh, one of two songs that I just dropped on September 4th. Um, it is called So Tired Part 1. It's a part of a mini EP I dropped called So Tired. And I'm so proud of these songs. I hope you love it. I hate that our time together was so short, but um, there's always next time. Remember, this is all about building native power. Um, we are so much stronger when we are together. Um, and this is So Tired Part 1. I hope you love it. Tired of feeling stupid before I voice when my truth is boy you have done quite a number on me and I'm tired of always watching my tone you should hear me in the mirror alone oh I I just want to breathe and no don't always have to be right But you should know when you're dead wrong And no, I don't want to start another fight But I'm scared of what might happen if we don't So do I stay, do I go? This is hell, heaven knows Do I stay? Seat of the cars in a million miles apart. I, I still need you, babe. And no, I don't always have to be right. But you should know when you're dead wrong. And no, I don't want to start another fight. But I'm scared of what might happen. Hey guys, I just wanted to say one more time, thank you so much for having me tonight. And uh, if you want to keep hanging out, you can always find me on Instagram uh, or Facebook at Brooke Simpson Official or on Twitter at Brooke Simpson. Um, my website is brooksimpsonmusic.com. And again, another big thank you to the Advanced Native Political Leadership. Thank you so much for having me. And remember, we build Native power together. Let's do it. I love you. Ooh, let's give it up for Brooke Simpson, everyone. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, Brooke Simpson is actually a member of the Halawasa Pony tribe, not Lumbee. I think I just wanted to claim her because she's so awesome. So, um, but yeah, she's from down the road from us. So, in closing today, I just want to thank the Advanced Native Political Leadership so much for hosting this event to all the incredible panelists performers, activists, elected officials, leaders, community members, every single one of you that are here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am so proud to be here to strengthen the Native voice and to build Native power, not only for this election, but for the long term. Relatives, stay safe, vote, and build Native power. Thank you so